Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect podcast, episode 47. The purpose of this podcast is to take high-level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano space and break them down into bite-sized, consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. So it's Rick and myself today as the host of the Cardano Effect. We want to thank everyone for tuning in. Remember, if you like what you see, if you, if you want to support the channel, the best thing you can do for us is hit that subscribe button. Our podcast is growing and we want to reach as many people as possible. We're trying to get many different people from many different communities and many different avenues of the blockchain space to come and talk on this program. And every episode, we're trying to improve the product. So please continue leaving your feedback and letting us know what we can do to improve. That being said, the previous two episodes, we were doing our live streams. Uh, we have some special guests that are that have joined us today, which Rick will be introducing very shortly. We're very excited to have them on, and we are very happy to get this podcast started. Um, I want to remind everyone that we do have a subreddit where we ask, when we have special guests, we ask everyone to drop the questions that they would like us to answer, and we, we, we focus on that in the, towards the latter half of the podcast. So... I want to get right into the mix of things. Remember that none of what we say on this podcast is financial advice. You are your best financial advisor. And if you don't think you are, you need to find someone who's qualified to do so. So without further ado, Rick, how are you doing today? What's going on? What's happening? Hey, good morning, Philippe. Doing great today. Thanks for asking. I would like to give a special thanks to our sponsor, IOHK. Thank you for sponsoring this podcast. I would also like to remind our viewers that this podcast is available on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, and all of your favorite streaming apps. We're on all the apps. And I would also like to do a quick screen share of, to show you what we're going to be going over today and then introduce our guest, Mr. James Kelly and the Lorian. So uh, I'm going to attempt the little screen share here to give a rundown on that. So what we plan to cover today is uh, the cybersecurity for users and operators of Cardano products, blockchain, and home computers, mobile devices. How do you protect your information, your nodes, and your wallets? And a, a quick rundown of the bullets here. We're going to go over what is ethical hacking or penetration testing, which is what our guests are involved with, and what is a red team. We're going to go over individuals, user, users and computers, and wallets first, because most of the viewers of this podcast are the users of wallets and computers and also mobile devices, stake pool web pages, um, securing stake pool nodes or how a stake pool node could be attacked. And lastly, there we're going to touch on miscellaneous items such as relay nodes, if we have information on that, other nodes, social media, and other advanced topics. So that's what we'll be covering today. So back over to our guests. Um, I'm going to introduce them. It is Mr. James Kelly and Nalorian. They both work in the fields of either cyber defense, computer security, red team, penetration testing. We often roll that up into a word called hackers, okay? Um, but there's different types of hackers that they can tell us about later on between gray and white and red hackers. And I don't know what they all are. I don't know what the differences are. So I want to start off with James. I want to ask you, sir, how are you doing today? And welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I've been watching your, watching your show for a while now. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm excited about Cardano, and I've been involved with security for too long. <laughs> but, um, yeah, sort of my background is uh, like 2002. I started up a company called Secure Diligence. We did, uh, you know, penetration testing. Ran, created an intrusion detection system. It was kind of before the the market heated up a, a whole lot, so there weren't a whole lot of us doing that work. Um, in some ways, the work was a lot easier. One of my big sales pitches was to just tell people, hey, just let me just take a quick look and see if I can find something. And I always would. And then they'd ask me how much to fix it. So sales were real easy back then. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And that was right after the dot-com boom and uh, cybersecurity became a very important topic mm -hmm. for everybody realizing that hackers were getting into people's stuff. All right. Thank you for that, James. Nalorian, how are you doing today? And tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. I'm pretty good. Um, originally, I was a uh, very young and very black hat, so the, uh, it was more about figuring out how things worked, and I was really curious. And getting into uh, you know the general things as the web started to develop, I started to move along with it, and of course, you get a, you get involved in those sorts of uh, talks and debates with people online. Things inevitably turn into you know how can I get this thing that I'm not supposed to get and maybe I could try that and you know and you get into that a little bit and it can go it can go sideways really fast but um 
thank God I had the considerable good sense to decide somewhere around the age of 16 that I didn't want to go to jail and, <laughs> and uh, decided that maybe it's best because what I was really after was the knowledge that I would just uh, make some VMs, put some stuff on it and try to attack that because then it's all mine and no one cares. And that grew into a kind of hobby, which developed into a passion. And then eventually, after my university, uh, which was a completely different field, <laughs> I, I worked at a company where, um, where I was just doing laboratory work. And in the end, uh, I started poking around their system, and then I brought it to their attention. And they didn't take that too well. So, <laughs> so I, uh, I left that job. But I thought maybe I should go into CyberSec. And I started looking for some companies. And then I started getting involved in some companies. And now, now I'm part of a red team for a large ISP in my country. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Well, thank you both for joining us today. And the first topic we want to touch on is ind individual users and their computers. We have a lot of Cardano users are running either Daedalus or Yoroi on their desktop. And there might be different security defenses for that. But what's the first thing that our, our users out there using Daedalus? They're running a node locally on their computer. It's downloading parts of the blockchain. What kind of measures should they be taking to secure their computers and protect their wallet? I mean, in my opinion, one of, I mean, if, you, if you have an extra computer that you can use that you don't surf the internet on and so forth, it can just be like a clean computer. That would be ideal, but not everybody's going to have that. A lot of people are just going to be surfing and using the same computer. Um, in my opinion, a couple of the things you might want to do is make sure you have a, like a paper wallet or something that you can put the majority of your funds in and, and then just have a small amount uh, in, you know, in the dataless wallet that's on your computer so that if it does get stolen, you're not suffering a big loss. I mean, I tend to approach everything from the perspective of I, assuming that I will get hacked, assuming that something will break and limit my exposure from that. But um, ideally you would have, you know, have the wallet installed on the computer that doesn't, that you're not installing, you know, random apps on or just browsing the internet because it's like your web browser, you know, is broken. You know, <laughs> there's a security vulnerability that nobody knows about yet. And so even if you're fully patched, you might visit a website and it installs some code on your computer and a wallet software is going to be targeted. And, you know, and the wallet software may not, may have some kind of security flaw in it as well. But, you know, if somebody gets like a key logger installed, they'll notice your password that you're typing and so forth. I mean, do have a password on there because, uh, you know, without the password, somebody can, you know, get a hold of the files and, you know, be able to, to do the transaction, steal your money. Uh, so you, you want to make it harder. Um, but I mean, that's my opinion on kind of like the starting point is, you know, isolate it, you know, put it on a different computer than you normally use, but also make sure you don't have too much of your funds there. Lock away most of your funds in cold storage. So let's say I'm a brand new user. I just bought my computer over at Best Buy. I bring it home. I installed Daedalus, load it up on there. Should I put in virus scanners on there? Do I need a firewall? What kind of stuff uh, do you guys recommend? Yes. Yeah, all that and more. But uh, there's there's a couple of things that you can do. So like most people aren't going to go to Best Buy and buy a new computer, right? New computers are generally still pretty okay so long as the first thing you do is bring them home and update them. But... Uh, the, most of the people out here will have Daedalus running on their computer that they've been using for maybe a year or so. Mm -hmm. And so there are there are things you added to them. You you installed games. You you visited a couple of websites and all kinds of stuff. And you really don't know whether or not you are vulnerable to something that could be exploited or have already been. There there are whole categories of malware that just remain low until the time is right. But there, there are several things that you can do. Like the, the whole idea behind Mirai was, was that it was a virus that just looked for really easy passwords on all kinds of things and spray the whole internet for that. And then it just gets a bunch of computers that way. And that's kind of the way that, that I would do it as well. I want to spray the internet and get the easy ones. I don't want to do work and get you who's doing too much to defend yourself. 
I don't want to have to do too much work. I want easy money. So what I'm going to do is figure out who has really easy passwords. You know, there have already been database dumps on old accounts on some website somewhere where you use the same password that you use for your Gmail. And I'm going to download those data dumps and I'm going to crack those passwords and I'm going to use those passwords on your current Gmail account and see if it's the same. Those kinds of things. Don't use the same password on your other email accounts. Don't use the same uh, logins for different software. Don't do those things. And please, please, please do not write the 24 word secret on a notepad TXT file in your, in your computer. Don't do that. Right? Every little thing you do that takes information away from me is going to help you. So virus scanner, yes. If you, if you can get some sort of software firewall, yes. Make sure your router is not passing stuff directly into your network. There's a, there's a lot of IoT devices that are coming on the market now. For example, uh, the, the cameras that go in your, uh, at your front door that you can access via your mobile wallet. Make sure those are coming from reputable companies and look for vulnerabilities for those things before you buy them because you may be creating a hole into your network at home. Do some research about the products that you're buying before you install them. Like, I know it's really cool to be able to go onto your phone and just be like, oh, someone's at my door. It's a package. I'm not there, so I can't accept it. But, you know, it's cool that I can see them. You know, that those, those are really great technologies coming up. But make sure that you investigate them thoroughly for also from the security side of your home network. Because if, if I know that I can spray the whole internet for that particular application and probably get an in, then your wallet's not safe. And make sure the camera's not pointing at your computer. Oh, yes, please. Don't do that. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. So the so the users get their devices at the you know the store at the Amazon or whatever it is. Most people usually have a home Wi-Fi router. Let's assume they're using the wallet from their home. Yeah. How does that router stop bad guys from getting in? Well, first of all, it, it it typically makes your whole network inside your house appear from one IP address. And any like the if I run a website here on my development machine and I, I can access it anywhere from within that network behind the router. But someone from the internet can't just query my IP address, port 80, and get that website on that development machine. The, the file, it, it has like a, a stop there, a defense. And it's you have to actually link the port on the router to the machine inside the router to be able to get that web page to the outside, to access, to the general access of the internet. Please don't do that, but that's how you would do it. And yes. yeah, oh, did you want to jump in? So yeah, well, I, well, his question was, how does the, the home Wi-Fi router stop them from getting in? And yes, you're right about what you were saying, but also it actually kind of helps them get in too, because it's a Wi-Fi router. And yeah. you know, it's like the, the, wi the Wi-Fi protocols are all pretty much broken. You know, if somebody wanted to, now this is going to require somebody to sit outside your house. Um, but if you're a whale and you have a ton of uh, Cardano you know, in your wallet, it might be worth it to make a road trip to somebody's house. You know, so. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, have to so, be very so. careful with the Wi-Fi protocols that you use. For example, mm -hmm. there was uh, not too long ago, people were still using WEP, which is largely considered absolutely broken. Like you mm -hmm. can crack those in, in under 10 minutes, if that. And there are still people out there today using that. WPA2 seems to be the default these days, and that's good. But uh, people are still setting default passwords on them. They're still setting mm -hmm. easy passwords on them. And yeah, you can just uh, you can just go around your neighborhood and just try password or Wi-Fi, and you may get a couple of networks. And if and if somebody's determined, even you know, even the more uh, you know. I guess the protocols that are currently in use can still be broken too. There are vulnerabilities. It takes more time and effort, but um, it's definitely doable if, if you're a target. Um, you know, I have Wi-Fi, but also have my uh, main computers uh, connected into a switch and not, not going over Wi-Fi, and that's all segmented off. Probably shouldn't be telling too much of the detail about how I have my network set up, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah. 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 but you, you kind of like you want to think of it like Wi-Fi itself as being 
you know, potentially compromised. And if you want to get really into it, you know, the, uh, you know, the ISP and so forth can, you know, monitor your traffic and so forth. So you have to treat everything as if it's compromised, you know, from the, from the very beginning. So okay. let, let's, so let's move over. I, I just wanted to move back a little bit because let's, let's take the average user who, who just got involved with cryptocurrency. They may not understand exactly what they need to do to protect themselves. Like in the current market, like in the, in the fiat system, I mean, it's a lot different than the cryptocurrency system. I mean, people can skim your credit card. There's data leaks on, on multiple different websites. You can, you can go on tour, you can go on the dark web, download people's credit card information, but there's a recourse to maybe getting your money back. Not all the time, but you know, you can contact your bank if you see some fraudulent charges for your credit card. But with crypto, someone empties your wallet, there's no recourse for this. Like there's no one you're going to call to help you get your money back. And there's, you're really out of luck. So the new user coming in, and this is a, this is very scary to a lot of people. What can they do? What are the initial, what are the steps that they need to take? The couple steps that they can take they don't have to go completely in depth that you would say are, are primary and of, of great importance. I would say for the absolute beginner, you know, you, you, you probably want to use something like the dataless wallet or something like that, because if you leave your your tokens on exchange, the exchange could get hacked. That happens, and they're they are prime targets. Um, you know, like I was at Cryptopia recently. I, I lost a you know I, I lost some, some not I didn't have a whole lot on there, but you know they got hacked and then they lock everything up and and you know I'll probably never see those funds again and, you know Mt. Gox I mean the exchanges get attacked they are targets so you don't necessarily want your money your, your token sitting there uh, so you probably do want it on a on a wallet on your own computer but I would say install the wallet put a password on there keep that um, you know those those recovery words that's generated safe and secure like in a putting your safe deposit box or something um, so that you don't lose your money if your computer blows up and you know so yeah password and and use a paper wallet you know generate a paper wallet from a computer that you know ideally from a computer that hasn't ever had anything installed on it but you know even even if you know it's not a fresh computer it's you're still going to be better off having that paper wallet and put most of your money there uh, that way it's just significantly less likely to be able to be stolen I, I would offer a slightly different advice. I think for for beginners, really, really new users, the easiest hardware wallets are coming along really nicely lately. And mm -hmm. like uh, like the the Ledger Nano X, for example, very nice and generates the private keys, keeps them stored off your computer. So even if you're using your computer daily, your your hardware wallet is not going to release the private keys to your computer, even if it requests it. At worst, they'll get your public or your your export key. In the case of Monero, like the the uh, the view all export key from Monero. But uh, for Cardano, it's just your your path, the path through key key generation. But it will never release the private keys, so they're always on that ledger. Mm -hmm. And so long as you keep those things uh, together. And you you don't really have to worry about it. You can operate with the Ledger Nano X with your eye, for example. Daedalus has to catch up with that. I would like to see that come out for Daedalus, and that that would be a big step in the right direction. And your eye doesn't allow the Ledger Nano X to operate with the mobile client, and that's that's a problem. I would really like to see that happen. But for the brand new user, the setup and use of the Ledger is uh is something that just can't be ignored it's a, it's mm. so easy to just be like yes that key is the same as on the screen it's this it's a very small learning curve and it keeps the private keys off the system that's the important part they're yeah. not on it hardware wallets are definitely you know, definitely way to go i i guess i was making the assumption that they're a beginner they wouldn't even know about a hardware wallet but, but yeah i mean that's that's definitely a good option yeah, and that's yeah. also a problem. The amount of information that people have in general is like, uh, it's it's hard to pin down. Who is a new user? Is it a user who knows about crypto but doesn't know about hardware wallets? Is it a person who has absolutely no idea about crypto? And that there, there are so many, like the, the industry is still young, if you can even call it an industry. It's, a, it's so young that we don't really have a to-do or how-to yet for the whole thing in general. 
-hmm. So the recommendation is is basically uh, it, both both methods are good: paper wallet, cold storage, hardware wallet. Um, you know, keeping your computer secure is. I I would. Personally, I feel uncomfortable having private keys on a system that I use daily. I would be really uncomfortable, but then like I'm the really paranoid sort. So <laughs> I don't know if that translates to the general user, but yeah, if you, if you have a lot of ADA, you know, oh, and another thing, don't use the same receiving address for all of your payments. Don't mm -hmm. do that. Keep using new addresses because if they hack one address, they get only the ADA that was sent to that one place like that, that sort of thing. Don't don't put everything to the same re receiving address all the time. Uroi, for example, will generate new addresses, and it'll show you which ones are used. Just don't use previously used addresses. Things like that can really help you. Yeah, I thought the addresses were for privacy, um, but I didn't want to go into all that um, yet. And right. if if you break, I could be wrong, but I thought if someone were to break one address to a wallet it breaks to the private key and they're in. They there, get all there's of them. A, there's, a pro, there's basically an agreement, a standard that we've done that you like a, you generate a master key and it generates all the sub keys. <clears> and <throat> that will generate corresponding public addresses. But that's mainly just by standard. You could still, conceive, like in Bitcoin, for example, it's very easy. You, you can generate multiple keys via this method, BIPs44 or whatever it is. And... You can still hack individual addresses. If you if you can get the private key for an individual receiving address, you can still get the money out of that address and no others. But if you get the, the 24 word phrase, you can generate every key in that line. Sort of like the master keys governing a, a lot, you know, however many private keys that you have that, yeah. that, that the software is generating for you. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me summarize the, uh, the basic scenarios. The average user has a home computer. They install Daedalus. We won't touch your row yet. They install Daedalus. It requires you to enter a password. They need to be using complex passwords. They need to have virus scanners on there. What are some common problems have you seen people use? You got people out there who they download some random Joe Blow virus scanner written by an unknown company, and it's probably doing more harm than good. Has that ever happened? Yes. Mm. Yes. <laughs> I, I've, run into, I've run into situations where somebody, you know, browsing the internet, something pops up, it says they have a virus or whatever, and tells them to download and install, install this, you know, antivirus product, which is actually not, and they end up paying for it. <laughs> There's a guy, he gave him his credit card number, and, and every year they send him a renewal for some fake AV product. <laughs> Oh yeah. So you're talking, people should be looking at the well-known products and trying to find experts, even if you're fresh to cryptocurrencies. And I know we're talking about very basic stuff here, but use stuff like Symantec, Zone Alarm, McAfee, Malwarebytes. I'm not giving them shout outs. I do not endorse them. However, I wouldn't download some random, you know, whatever, because someone said it was an antivirus scanner. It has to have some credibility to it. It has to have a track record. Check out the reviews on Tom's hardware. Check out the reviews in the magazines. Make sure you got a good virus scanner. If you're using a internet firewall if, or, or you have a internet Wi-Fi router, the router side stops some traffic coming in. But if you put a rogue device inside your house, it exposes a port, right? And a bad guy can come in. Mm -hmm. So if I got a, a laptop, like right here, I have a laptop with Daedalus. And if I expose my computer used with some rogue device or some internet of things that wasn't made well, can hacker get in using that weakness and make their way around a little? Is it possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's actually possible both ways. There, there are devices that have been found to not not only open ports so that hackers can get in, but ones that call out. So the the thing the firewall doesn't stop is reverse shells, for example. I mean, it can, but in most cases the reverse shell is is the the easiest method to deal with firewalls you get the the remote computer to call you instead so the firewall thinks oh it's coming from inside the network well i'll just let that through and yet yeah, have all the information and that's really the way it works if if you have some rogue device inside your network it could be calling out and that's the danger because you'd never see it not unless you have some really big ids or something some printers. You're going to show even. some. Sorry, go ahead, James. Yeah, some, some printers even open up those vulnerabilities. It's 
<laughs> but it's like a, for the everyday person, it's also just the, you know, just going to like a web page, there might be a vulnerability in your web browser. So if your computer is not up to date with its patches and so forth, it's probably very vulnerable. Uh, but even if you are up to date in patches, uh, you, know, you could just visiting a web page can kick off some program that could then connect out to the internet and allow, allow the hacker in. in. In those cases, it's usually just yeah, some guy that's you know looking at a million different computers on the internet all at once. He's not specifically targeting you, yeah. but wallet software would be on his list of things to take a look at. Yeah. yeah. Now, and then let me give you another example where Yorori runs inside Chrome or Firefox, and there's another um, browser called Yandex that works like Chrome. Um, mm -hmm. And there's other lookalike brands that use the same program. So let's say I have Yorori installed in Chrome. Are there, what are the vulnerabilities? Let's say I install other plugins, chit chat plugins, you know, pay on Amazon plugins, all this other random stuff. Does it affect that Yorori plugin? It's sitting right next to it. Is there any vulnerabilities exposed by doing that? I know you're not security auditors, but is there something out there on my computer that may become a problem? Like even the keystroke logger, I go in to type my password in Yoroi. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I, I don't know specifically about about those plugins that you mentioned, but mm -hmm. uh, installing plugins onto your computer definitely can open up, you know, vulnerabilities. You know, there's like search bars that people have installed. Um, you know, just any anything you install, though, it's not you know, just in your web browser. You know, like in order to start this meeting, I had to launch some Zoom app, and you know, it's like I, I double checked this, make sure it looked like it was probably coming from a legitimate source, but I didn't really have enough time to fully vet it. So you could have already hacked me already, but <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah, haven't been hacked yet. That's a bad there's way. there's always a danger when you're when you're adding things to your we we call it the attack surface. Every, everything you do, everything you put in your network, all the stuff you add to your computer adds to your attack surface. And the like for a plugin, just think about what plugins do normally. Like you, you, you all have your eye, right? Your eye opens a new tab when you click on the button. Well, what if that that tab opened up a different web page? What if you downloaded the wrong your eye and it opened up a tab and said, you know, send to this receiver address, and it wasn't actually yours? And and then you just keep doing that, thinking you have the actual Uroi Uroi wallet. <laughs> and mm -hmm. It's stuff like that that can that can really grab you. Like uh, malicious plugins aren't always things that want to get access to your computer. They can be. Uh, it's sort of a social engineering attack where it pretends to be something, but it's not. And and you think it is, and therefore you do things that you think you're paying your own wallet when actually you're paying someone else's. Stuff like that, you have to be very, very careful of. If you ever see a certificate error when you're doing something like that, stop. Oh, yeah. People <laughs> ignoring that drive me nuts. Yeah. How many people, like, uh, they ignore the HTTPS certificate mm -hmm. errors all the time. You, know, you, want, you want to make sure you see the padlock on any web page you're going to. And if, it, if your web browser is warning you that something could be wrong, it probably is wrong. Just trust it on that. <laughs> yeah. Look into it or ask somebody else who knows. Browsers these days are pretty good at noticing when things are a little shifty. And if, if it says something, it's not for nothing, unless you are absolutely sure that, that you know why it's wrong, just, just don't, right? Figure out a different way. Uh, do, it, do it differently or don't do it at all. Do it later. So a little patience goes a long way. That reminds me for some reason of like a, a scam that's happening now where people are actually calling people. Uh, you know, scammers are calling people on the phone and saying that they've you know, found a problem you know, with their computer or you know, whatever, and they ask them to install some app so they can fix the problem for them. And you know, so it's like it's sort of like to the side, but you want to make sure that anybody you're interacting with, you've initiated that conversation and you know why things are happening. Because if somebody's telling you there's a problem, they're mm. probably lying to you. And just, oh yeah, the Microsoft tech support people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's always fun. Spe yeah. Speaking about mobile vul vulnerabilities, people calling you. I want to backtrack to something that James said earlier about exchanges and exchange hacks. You mentioned a Cryptopia hack. You mentioned Mt. Gox. So I'm, we are always encouraging people to move it off an exchange. I mean, that's how you're going to be able to communicate with this platform. That's how you're going to be able to get full use of the Cardano blockchain. But 
you know, people, uh, they, they, they have access to an exchange, they have access to their Coinbase, Bittrex, Binance, whatever exchanges that they're using, and then they enable the 2FA. And uh, two-factor authentication, while it's better than not having it, there are some vulnerability, vulnerabilities there. People can spoof your number. Can you go into uh, more depth of what could be done to just, just completely destroy people's accounts, even though they think that they have a one-time passcode or a uh, two-factor authentication, whether that's Google Authenticator or whatever other program that they're using? You don't want to use the SMS options. Uh, mm-hmm. There's vulnerabilities in... You know, it, the, the telephone systems are, you know, old and they're open and there's ways, there's things that you can do to actually redirect SMS messages. So if, if you're a target, somebody's looking to get you and you're using SMS, um, they can get you that way. Um, you know, the, the Google Authenticator app is a good option. There's also Authy. I, I like, I like Authy. Of course, now I'm telling my secrets, but, um, <laughs> you know, because it'll... It, well, with Google Authenticator, if if you lost the device that that was installed on, you could be locked locked out of your account. Um, well, Authy will allow you to do some synchronization. Um, SMS is less safe, I think, than than these other, you know, than like using Authy or Google Authenticator. But even that's not perfect because when you initially set it up, it's uh, creating like a little gives you like a little code that's based on time. And if somebody else were to intercept that, then they could have an authenticator app of their own running on their own computer, creating the same codes. So, you know, so it's not foolproof. It's not perfect, um, but it, but it definitely helps. Some something I really want to impress upon because I feel really strongly about the way that companies are kind of rolling out two-factor authentication codes as well, because like Google Google released their Google Authenticator. But there, there's no warning to the user, like, uh, please don't put this on the same phone that you're using with your email. Because like, the, the whole point of having a two-factor authentication is that it represents the something you have in the security training. So something you are, something you have, and something you know. So what you know is the password. What you are is a username or a fingerprint or whatever. And then something you have is supposed to be a completely separate device. Like uh, originally they called them key fobs because they were little devices that were separate from everything else. And you would just click a button and it would generate a number for you. But now they, they kind of made like a, an app for that. But here's the problem. If, if, you, uh, if you're calling someone and you put your phone down at a cafe and it's unlocked and I just swipe that, not only do I have your phone in an unlocked position, but I have your email. And I also have the authenticator app that is used with that email. And if you really think about it, how much of your life is tied to an email? It's like the gatekeeper for everything. Want to reset your password? I'll send it to this email. Want to get a new account name? Send it to that email. Hmm. You know, we want to talk to all of my contacts. Well, that's in my email account, you know, Gmail. Oh, you need two-factor authentication? Oh, there's the app and there's the problem. Do you need a recovery address? It's an email. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like all of this stuff is so tied to it. I would, I really wish people would like, I know they want convenience and that's the, the issue because we want everything in the same place. Yeah. It's so hard to, to protect you when it's, when the app is in the same place, because you're, you're basically asking for access in the same place that you're verifying that access. Mm-hmm. And mobile phones in general are pretty good these days. Like apps can't talk to each other and the actual OS themselves are really, really good. Um, they're not perfect, obviously, but they're, they're really good as compared to a personal computer these days. But uh, if you do things that compromise your own security structure, like putting the something you have with the something you know in the same device, they basically, they're, they're the same thing. And then you lose that part of your security trinity and the protection it offers. And it's it's stuff like that that you need to start thinking about. Maybe I I put the Google Authenticator on my iPad at home and not on my phone. Maybe I don't put my email on my iPad. You know, just keep them on two devices. Nearly everyone has an iPad and an iPhone or, you know, some variant Android. Absolutely. And you synchronize it. Yeah. You want everything on everything. I want, I got everything on my phone, my tablet, my laptop. Yeah. It's all on every, I got everything on everything. And and like if someone danger. blows a hole in me, I'm done. So yeah. 
Maybe you, you have to... <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So, oh, so I, I'm sorry, you were going to say James Cat. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, the Authenticator app doesn't need to talk to the internet, you know, because it's, it's all completely based on time. So if you, so you can just have it on a device that's not even connected to, to anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it'll work just fine like that. It, it operates based on a secret and, and a couple of other data points, and that's it. So it, it doesn't even need internet connection. It's, you know, one thing about security is I'll never say something secure. I'll get it to the point where I feel like it's not going to be hacked, but there's, there's only some way. So it's like, you know, I mentioned earlier, just kind of like limiting your exposure a little bit, whatever you're actively working with, make sure you don't have too much there. Um, but just always kind of like, you know, think about it in terms of like what, will happen if this does get hacked and then you can, can just kind of limit your risk. Um, because mm -hmm. you know, if we implemented even the best, you know, best practices for security, something can still happen, you know, yeah. or somebody could, you know, he says like somebody swipe the cell phone while you're using it, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you can lock your cell phone, you can, you, you lock your computers when, when you uh, walk away from it, but you know, somebody could come in with a gun and just say, Hey, you know, punch in the code. And it's like, what are you going to do then? Um, you, know, you punch in the code, but if you didn't have all your, your money in that one wallet, then it doesn't matter. You got something, but not all of it. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I want to give you guys a scenario. Thank you for that, James and Nolari. And I very much appreciate everything that you've, give, that you've provided so far. And I'm, I'll give you a scenario. I have a laptop here. I'm going to Starbucks. I connect to a public Wi-Fi. Nope. I, 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 why not? No, just I do don't. All the time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. And, and that's <laughs> part of the problem that, so, let me ask you something. Does it use a password when you connect to that Wi-Fi? Sometimes. Oh, at Starbucks? No, because I saved it on my computer. But yes, it asks for a password, but it's some mundane password. It asks okay, you to author it asks you to click a license or you know, like accept their agreement, but there's no password on that. Uh, yeah. it, it's it's wide open. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a so whole the class problem? of attacks. Well it Okay, so there's a device that's been generated for this uh, specific purpose, although it is not required to conduct the attack. The attack can be conducted with something as simple as a Raspberry Pi Zero, which is a very small computer, very cheap, small computer. They're about 10 bucks. And, but the, the actual device designed for this purpose is called a Wi-Fi Pineapple. And you can look up Hack5 Wi-Fi Pineapple and you'll find it right away. Its whole purpose, like when you connect to open-ended Wi-Fi, your phone never forgets that Wi-Fi, ever. So it will constantly, as you're walking around, even if you're in India, it'll constantly go, hey, is Starbucks Wi-Fi out there? Hey, is Starbucks Wi-Fi out there? And as soon as it finds it, as soon as the device says, oh yeah, that's me, hi, it will automatically connect. The, the whole purpose of that pineapple is to say, yep, that's me, to anything. And then wow. your internet traffic is going through me. So I just sit at Starbucks all the time and just like set this thing up in my knapsack and just see who connects to it. You can even cause deauthic de authentication. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> Attacks against anyone who is connected so that they'll de deconnect from the whatever the real network that they're supposed to be connected to and possibly uh, connect to your network instead. Yeah, you get it them to the knock them off, the, mm -hmm. knock them off yeah. so they try to reconnect. Exactly. And then the, once they're all connected to you, you can listen to all that traffic, whatever it is. That's pretty crazy. So yeah, if, if you're doing, can you get into their computer? Like if- That if, depends. That really depends on what they're doing. It's yeah. possible. And I'll, I'll give you some examples. Like if people really need to update their software, it, when it says software update, if you're still running Mac OS Al Capitan, you need to sort that. If you're still running like Windows Vista, yeah, just no. <laughs> boy, just yeah, no. you you, so you might want to sort that out because there's the newer software they patch the vulnerabilities. The older software, the vulnerabilities are well known, right? Yeah, there's even some version like some of the earlier versions of Windows 10 aren't being updated anymore. I don't remember the, the details of it, but they have like their they do these refreshes of Windows 10, but mm -hmm. the older ones, are, they're not actually being maintained anymore. They, they want you to, to bump it up, but some computers don't automatically upgrade because they might have some printer driver or something that's preventing it from doing it. Um, 
But one thing you're talking about, like if the traffic's flowing through some man in the middle, you know, man in the middle attack where somebody's pretending like they're your Wi-Fi router, so they get to see all the traffic that flows through your, uh, you know, that they get to see all the traffic that your internet service provider would see. Um, one thing you can do to, to mitigate that is to use a VPN. Um, there's some good ones that are even free, um, you know, like. Um, you know, Proton, you know, like if you go to like the Proton Mail, you can create like a nice secure email account and they offer free VPN that you can use. Um, it's, it's somewhat limited where you can choose it from where you say you're coming from. Cause like when you connect to a VPN, you're, you're connecting to some other computer and all your traffic flows through that computer first before going out to the internet. And you know, some of these VPNs will let you say connect from Chicago or let you connect from England or, or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so like the free version has limited places you can say you're connecting from. And if you pay for it, you can connect from just about anywhere in the world. You have to trust your VPN provider because you're because you know your traffic's flowing through them. But at least if there was a man in the middle attack, all of your traffic going through is encrypted, so they just get gibberish. Um, it's, yeah. So if you have to, please use VPNs every time you you connect to those networks. And if it's not working for some reason, then maybe something's up. But I've, the, heard, I've heard some people say when you use a VPN, you're transferring the trust. You're simply transferring the trust from your internet service provider to the VPN provider. You mm -hmm. are, you are, but the, that's not the threat you're mitigating against. So every time you employ something, uh, something to your security architecture, you are defending against specific types of attacks. So you're not trying to avoid your ISP in the case where you're at Starbucks, just trying to get access to your Gmail. You're trying to, you're trying to avoid the random idiot like me who's sitting there with a pineapple. And because of that, yeah, the VPN will do that just fine. That will prevent the man in the middle attack from the local public Wi-Fi, which a lot of people have to use. If you're mm -hmm. budget limited, resource limited, or so, uh, sometimes the only internet I have that I can get to is public Wi-Fi. Yeah. And so that, if you're on public probably... Wi-Fi, you can use a VPN because you don't know who the ISP is for that Wi-Fi. You don't know if there's someone sitting with a pineapple. So the VPN, if you use Nord VPN, or Kaspersky VPN or any of those uh, well-known providers, mm -hmm. you're putting your trust in that well-known provider as opposed to some random, you have no idea what's on that network because everything going across is dead encrypted. So if you're using an exchange, typing in passwords, or your computer could be compromised, at least the VPN gets you to someone you can trust or you think you can trust. You trust more than the people around you at the cafe shall we say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's at least that. Yeah. So, Cause that, yeah. that applies to any public Wi-Fi, right? Libraries, anything, yeah, anything, McDonald's. At all. anything yeah. that's not your home Wi-Fi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or, or your work, you know, or if he knows your home address, he might sit outside your house, but, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, yeah. but even then you should have a WPA2 passphrase on your, on your home Wi-Fi. And it's, if, uh, if your computer has, has the passphrase saved, like if it has an, a record of only that Wi-Fi with a password, then it won't try to connect to it without it. It'll try to connect to it with it, and that'll just never work. It'll just try, keep trying to negotiate the handshake forever. If you want to get crazy with it, you can also, in your router, you can specify like a whitelist of the, hard, the MAC addresses of devices that are allowed to connect as well. Um, yes. So you can kind of you know, tighten things and if, up. And Maybe. if you are technically able to do that, I recommend it. And I'm sure James does as well, but like uh, most people might end up messing up their network. So be very careful <laughs> because if you, if you whitelist only one Mac address and it's wrong, then you won't be able to connect it to it via Wi-Fi again until you, yeah, you have to plug in the cable in to get into yeah. it. <laughs> so be careful, you know, but yes, if you can do it, if you're if you're capable, then yes, uh, absolutely, whitelist the addresses. No Just, blacklist. Do not blacklist things. <laughs> whitelist only. Yeah, allow only what you want. And so yeah. by default, deny all, allow known. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. And, hey, and you, use a cable to plug into your router if you can. Like if if your computer, I mean, if you have a laptop, and you want to sit on the sofa. Obviously, it's not going to be very convenient. But if, um. But I, I use desktop computers, and 
you know, so I, I actually just have cables running into a, to a switch that connects to the, the router. So those com computers, the computers that I use uh, for everything that's, you know, I'm concerned about doesn't even broadcast over a wireless network, which just makes it that much more safe. Okay, so plug in, plug in with a cable if you can, reduce the attack surface of the Wi-Fi. That sounds like a good plan. And what was yep. the name of that one more time? The latest type of Wi-Fi authentication, the type of encryption, what should we be using? Uh, I'm not sure what the latest is, but currently most routers are deployed with WPA2. Okay. All right, WPA2 or whatever the latest best is, because it's probably going to work better. The other ones are... Yeah, Wi-Fi 3 is coming out, and <laughs> already vulnerabilities are found in it, so we're, mm. we're really not sure where this is going to go. But currently, most routers are going to be deployed with WPA2, and and that, that for the most part, is pretty good. Uh, one other thing to note is that there are attacks against the WPS button that you, that you press and connect devices to, like printers. If you can uh, disable those, that would be good. Because uh, a while back, a pixie dust attack was, a, was possible against WPS, and it, the router was just listening for those kinds of things, and you could just connect to it via that. And it considerably reduced the time to be able to uh, get into a network. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if, it's, if most routers are still vulnerable to that or not, but uh, it's something to keep in mind, that other functionalities can bring your network down as well. It, that brings up a point too is like the routers have software that need to be updated mm -hmm. as well you know so if you know you keep your windows or whatever up to date you also have to think you know that your your router also needs to be updated and some routers have the option to let you know where they can automatically update but you probably should check to, to see if it's running an outdated version because you know even the the most high-end uh routers have had problems where somebody can just come in from the outside. You know, you have it configured perfectly and yep. they still skate in. Because hard-coded yeah. passwords or whatever in the firmware, you never know. A lot of times I think the U.S. government's at fault for that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah they, but, they, they, get, they get like Cisco to put back doors in and then somebody finds yeah, it. Yeah, and, and we, oh. we go nuts searching for this kind of stuff. This is the world we live in where, where fridge, your fridge has like a little computer in it that's talking to the internet and you have to be super careful. They're putting meters for power and gas usage, uh, smart meters in there with computers that connect to the internet. Everything is a computer now, even cars. And we have to think about that when we're when we're dealing with this stuff because your car is definitely going to have your Wi-Fi password. Is it vulnerable? Can I shut your brakes off? Turns out, yep. For some models of cars, yeah. Wow, <laughs> man, that's pretty amazing. You're making me paranoid, but that's okay. Um, I'm a little yeah, bit welcome paranoid. Welcome to our world. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, it's like spy versus spy stuff. It's pretty cool. Let's go. Uh, I want to go on to our next big chunk of individual users' devices, and that's mobile phones. All right. Here I got Yoroi on my iPhone. And what should I be doing to keep it safe? You know, can I just uh, install any app right here off the App Store, like this no. one? It's called. Uh, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. why not? Why can't no, I do can. that? Because you can never just do that. The, the answer is always no when you say, can I just. The yeah. answer is no. <laughs> but I like playing games. What about this game that's called uh, Yoroi Game? Oh, that might be a virus. Um, there <laughs> yes. was, on a serious note, on, on the on the desktop computers, there was somebody posting a deadless.zip file in Telegram uh, and, no. and saying, hey, here's the latest security update to Daedalus. Hmm. And people downloaded that. Oh, God. It, it was a very, very targeted software program. It goes after the location of the private key and it watches you for to enter a password. When it did, bam, it had everything it needed to steal your funds and it happened, at least based on reports. I can only go based on what I've seen in Telegram and I've seen that happen in Telegram. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. We'll make sure we put links to the proper websites down below mm -hmm. in the section. In, the, in this video, we'll put the, the proper official links. I know everybody wants, oh, decentralized. We can't have official. You need it. You need, you got to have official Never follow Otherwise, link. Even like, you know, even if I get like an email or like when you post a link below, I, I still won't follow it. Use it as information, you know, like, like you can click on and bring it up and see it. But uh, whenever you know that you want to update something, go find where you know it is actually is and don't just don't click on a link because somebody could change that link. 
<laughs> and you know, so, so this uh, your your video account gets hacked, so they change the link, and then it goes somewhere else, and it's just got like a slight misspelling in the domain name or something, and and boom, you're downloading the wrong thing. So it's like try to try to navigate to what you know is the the real original source for it, and then pull it off of there. Um, yeah, because it's easy to get tricked. Yeah, develop develop a a sort of plan plan for things like if if I were going to download an update from IOHK for example or something I would start looking at the company and how they generally release software like over time what well, what what do they usually do what would be abnormal so if IOHK always updates Jormungandr on the GitHub page and I know where that is then I'm not going to download something off Telegram that says, oh, the latest implementation of Jormungandr is right here. No, no, because the company never updates via that way. It raises red flags. So if you have an adequate MO for the company you're talking about in your mind, you'll, you'll gain these sorts of uh, early detection systems in your head. And that's, that's really good to implement for anything, including Windows, including anything else. Email is one of the most archaic forms of communication we still have today, apart from regular mail. That a lot of people don't understand that you know there, there are servers out there that literally validate nothing about a message. You can, you can claim you are anyone, you can mm-hmm. send to anyone, you can, you can post a link and then have the text that shows up uh, as the link and they can be different. So you can, you, and you know this because you hover over links with your mouse and they're completely different than what's appearing there on your email. And this is a huge reason why spammers are still a thing. And, you know, has anyone ever wondered why we haven't kicked them off the internet? It's because of this. Yeah, you can impersonate anything with email so long as you have the right server to relay it to. I've had too much fun uh, impersonating email. You know, you, you, yeah. You, you need these special <laughs> software for it. You know, you just, if you know the commands to type into the email server directly, you, know, you just turn it into it, and you can say, "Okay, it's from you know whoever you want it to be from." Oh, they're boss. Whitehouse.gov. Yeah, yeah. Like, I actually yeah. did that. Yeah. I, I've actually yeah. done that. Uh, president at Whitehouse.gov. Yeah. So someone imperson someone impersonated me on Telegram asking people for Ada. Oh yeah, that's, that's I spent happen. too much time on Telegram. They're like, "Oh, they know this idiot," so they impersonated me. They took my image, my avatar, and made my name. But if you click on the username, it's a totally different username. And said, hey, give me Ada. But people in Telegram go, oh, that guy doesn't ask for Ada. So they caught him and booted him out. Mm. Um, that's just an example. But even verification <laughs> methods are not uh, are not foolproof. For example, Charles Hoskinson, the, the actual Charles Hoskinson is not verified on Twitter. And this was a huge debate for a little while, right? Because there are, if you look up his name, there are several accounts of him. And they all have the same avatar and the same bio and everything like that. So the OSINT is there, but like the the actual person, Charles Hoskinson, is not could be a random Twitter account that you don't really know. So you, you would have to go back into the history of the user to see whether or not it is in fact the real guy. But even with authentication on Twitter, I mean, didn't Jack get uh, hacked the other day? And uh, that was don't even. I mean, that was, that was an SMS exploit. Uh, Okay. <laughs> somebody, somebody sent messages, um, you know, po- pretending to be his cell phone number, and you know, so the messages came through SMS, posing as from his phone, and then Twitter went ahead and published them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so they didn't actually get into his computer, but okay. there was a way around it. But you know, like the blue check mark on Twitter isn't necess- even if he had that, it's not necessarily yeah. proof because exactly you can get an account that has a blue check and rename it. People actually have done that. I've seen that before. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like it, it, I saw like one like really aggressive example where like Elon Musk had posted something, and then so it's in a in a thread where you know, he's actually having a conversation. Somebody had a blue checkmark account that they renamed Elon Musk and replied into that saying, you know, that he's giving away some, some Bitcoin, <laughs> you know, just send some to this address and I'll send you back, you know, 10 times as much. It's like, no, yeah. everybody did that guy. <laughs> Lost their mind. Oh God. You know, we call this common sense. You know, early in the program, we touched on updating your software, installing antivirus, good security practices. It's not common sense. You have to assume a zero knowledge base I know it sounds rude, but 
it's the only way to protect the new users coming into the system. Because if you're a new user and you get your coins ripped off, are you going to deal with Bitcoin anymore? Are you going to deal with Cardano? No, you're going to walk away. Say no. Or, or worse, you, you continue. Yeah. Worse, you continue still doing the same mistakes. Yeah. Because like, whole, whole families will get destroyed like that. Yeah. Anyone saying this gets us into the social engineering. So we may as well hit that point now and then we'll get to the nodes later. Yep. And that is anyone offering you money for more money is it's a lie. Please don't do it. You know, if they say send me one ADA and I'll send you back 10, it's always a scam. Always. Always. Yep. Think and about it. Think about it in a personal example. If someone told you that in the middle of the street. You'd be distrustful of them. Give me this and I'll give you this, you know, like loan me your car and, you know, I'll give you a nicer car tomorrow. You know, would you do that? If someone came up to you and said that to you, don't do it on the internet. Whatever you would do in normal life, I mean, carry those practices to the internet and be distrustful of people. No one's going to be handing out, handing you out free money. And especially, you know, Charles is not going to hand you out free money. He has enough money. He doesn't need your money. He's not going to hand you anything. No one's going to hand you anything. You, you got to figure out the information yourself. Yeah. It's exactly like if you go to San Diego, downtown San Diego, Horton Plaza, and the guy with a, a waiter tray walks up to you with three cups on it and there's a ball under the cup, don't play that game. Yeah. He's going to take yeah. your money. Yeah. Sing, you know, hey, if you bet $1, you can make $20. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know the guy down the street that just made money? That's his friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're social engineering the people walking up mm -hmm. and down the sidewalk. And, and the same even, thing happens on the internet. <laughs> yeah, and even if they're not, I would start uh, try to develop your own mind for these sorts of things. Like let's let's take that example. Uh, I I offer to send people uh, 10 8 of this ME1. Well, there's two possibilities, right? Either it's a scam, and then you should ask the question, why don't I just send you my address and you can send me nine ADA? Right? Simple math. That's what you're going to end up with. Let's just save ourselves the transaction fees and make it cheaper. Right? Yeah. If that's not the case, then it's probably a scam. Or what if it's real and they actually do it? Nobody does anything for free. Yeah, next time they won't. What if, <laughs> yeah. Huh? What if... What if I'm, I'm paying with something that I don't know I'm paying for? Maybe, yeah, they'll, they'll do the scam later when I send them 20 ADA. Or maybe I'm paying with something I don't understand that I'm paying with yet. For example, Facebook. I, a lot of people are on Facebook these days, and you're paying with your information. Facebook is not free. All of your information is going into Facebook, and they're using that to collate a whole data set on all of the users. And that's used in many different industries not just Facebook's partners. And that's, that's the whole Edward Snowden revel revelation, right? Like the, that data is very, very important. So you're paying with something. What is it? And if you don't know what it is, how do you know that it's worth nine ADA? The example I gave earlier of somebody who was paying uh, for some fake antivirus software, he was actually a bank vice president, which is <laughs> kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but he was getting billed regularly for this software and he thought he had something functional you know so they, they didn't even rip off his account well i mean they're ripping him off but it's not like they tried to drain his bank account they just kept taking the money out as they told him they would do on a regular basis so somebody actually could be operating what would seem to be a legitimate manner but they're not actually legit and odds are who this was had that software on his computer because he knew he was a bank vice president and we're maybe hoping to get more information that they could, and, and who knows, maybe they actually stole some money from their bank customers. I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, you have to be kind of skeptical about everything that you're, you're dealing with. If you're installing software, you know, there could be some game that you want to, it's a popular game that you want to uh, put on your phone and it can be completely legit. And then the person who wrote that software can sell it. To somebody else now somebody else is maintaining it and this has happened before this yep. new maintainer puts mm -hmm. something malicious into the software you get an update hey new update for my favorite game boom you know <laughs> so it's like you kind of want to just limit what you what you do don't just jump straight into things um and you know wherever you keep your wallet keep that as pristine as you can yep and if you're done with things also, on a side note, remove them. 
So say say you were done done with that game a year ago, and you and you just keep updating your phone since then, but you haven't played it in a year. Why didn't you clean it off? Right, a year later, a vulnerability happened because it was handed off to new developers, for example, and and you got caught because you're not doing proper cleanup. So uh, things are straggling, and of course, adding to your attack surface, and you became vulnerable to something later in life because you didn't clean anything. So have some have some housekeeping in your mind as well. Mm -hmm. That's some like a uh, bubble level or software on, on a phone. And just the other day, an update came in, you know, saying that it had an update to install. I was like, why, why would this even need an update? I thought it's uninstalled. <laughs> I didn't even bother <laughs> yeah, to install exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just that should be your default position. Not using it every day. Don't need it right now. Get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. James, before we move on to the stake pool example, we were talking a little bit behind the scenes about what you're doing with uh, Whale Wars. Mm -hmm. I just wanted you to tell the story to the audience and just uh, kind of describe how how um, how often you're getting attacked and how often people are trying to penetrate systems in cryptocurrency and trying to steal people's funds. How how prevalent is this issue? Well, I created Whale Wars uh, dot com. You know, it's whale wars with a z it's just a cryptocurrency trading competition website and most of the people using it are going to be kind of savvy because they're already they're trading cryptocurrency trying to make money with it of course most of them lose their money but you know it's uh, that's just the way it goes with trading um so it's sort of a it, it's 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 a target you know the, the website itself is a target because people understand that you know the traders are coming to the site and um, and I receive Bitcoin. Some of the competitions have entry fees. Um, most of them are free, but um, you know, so I'm receiving Bitcoin. So people are looking at it from the perspective of, hey, maybe this is a site I want to hack. And from the day it went up live, it was getting attacked and it, it still gets attacked. I mean, people try all the little tricks. Um, they create users with, you know, special characters or things like that in, in the name or try to put like a little script code and like the username or something like that when they when they, when they sign up for it they're, they're just trying to find vulnerabilities in it they they pound the server with you know a scanning software and, and so forth and you know I I put a I designed the thing from the beginning with security in mind because you know if you just design it to make it work first you'll never get back to the security. That never happens. Uh, you know, cause to make something secure, you're probably going to break it. Um, you know, it's like people tend to start leaving the security out because something's not working right. And they're not sure if it's a security that caused it not to work. So I only, I only start from the beginning with security and I keep working on that thing until it works with the security still in place. But even though I do that, I still assume that it's not secure. Um, so if anybody were to actually hack into one of those web servers, they'd be disappointed <laughs> because the stuff that they're looking for is not there. Um, I keep it somewhere else. I'm not saying where I keep it, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so they, they could maybe, you know, cause a little sabotage or something, you know, uh, corrupt the database, uh, you know, the, the leaderboard would have, you know, some profanity on it or something like that if they were able to hack that server. But, um, but I mean, it's constantly attacked, all sorts of attacks coming at it. And, you know, but it's the cryptocurrency world is full of people that know about these sorts of things, you know, and if they can steal something, they'll do it. <laughs> I mean, there's people out there that will do it. Um, yeah, so I'm not yeah. sure if that they got to what you were asking about, yes. but no, yes. it was, it's always under attack, always under yeah. attack all day, every day, day after day, whale wars, bam, under attack. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's something live. <laughs> yeah. It's and it's something to keep in mind for your for your general attitude towards anything. A, a lot of people come out and say it's unhackable. It's mm -hmm. safe. No, it's not. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as safe. There's no such thing as unhackable. There's only good enough for now, safe for now, no known vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Zero days are not yet released on the darknet. Mm -hmm. Like there, there are actual entire governments whose whole job is to just buy up zero days on the dark net and then hold them for that moment that they need them. Like we, do, we never get to see them and hopefully we discover them first, but that's not always the case. Like a large, large nascent states with the budget, not naming any names, 
but larger nation states with the budgets to do such a thing, they'll, they'll have a couple in their pocket just in case. And if they can't do that, then they'll develop entire networks of viruses like Stuxnet. Stuxnet. What, what, what's the short description of a zero-day virus? Assume I don't know what one is. The z- so the, the zero and the day refer to how many days of vulnerability has been known. So a one day would be right after release. Oh, like a seven day would be, you know, it's, pr- it's pretty well assumed to be in the wild. And, but a zero day is absolutely unknown by anyone. So you can't defend, typically can't exactly. defend against it. Okay. Exactly. There's cool. no defenses in place. No one knows about it. So how do you defend against it? And it's unknown. Yeah. Whoever discovers the vulnerability, they're, you know, they're sad. You know, they can exploit that vulnerability. I mean, there are ways you defend against that. You know, like, like when I said that, what they're, if they hack, if somebody hacks into Whale Wars, and I just assume that somebody will. And I keep that as like an assumption. You know, I hope it doesn't happen. I try to prevent it from happening. I do everything I can. Um, but if they do, you know, as I said, what they're looking for is not there. I don't keep the private keys on that server. I don't keep anything like that there at all. Um, the the I have other servers that do different things, and there's so much isolation and segmentation. You know, it's like they can't talk back and forth to each other. There's like some one-way communications that happen for some things and so forth, but you know, it's like if you set things up in a way that even if it does get hacked, you're not suffering a loss, then that's how you prevent against a, a zero day. So in other words, I can't help the fact that somebody will probably find some zero day vulnerability in the operating system that's running well Wars website. And somebody might exploit that. It, the best I can do is hope that the person who finds that vulnerability isn't the one who attacks the website and that I patch it before it becomes known how to do that. Um, but you just, mm-hmm. you just have to assume it's going to happen. And, and what are you going to do if that happens? Yeah. Can I touch on something interesting? Then we'll get right onto the stake pools. Yeah. yeah. My previous virus scanner I used to use when it would update, I would have to reboot. Okay. Mm-hmm. My current, I switched to a new virus scanner. And even while we're sitting here talking right now, I got a pop-up tab that says it updated. Mm-hmm. So it updates like five or six times a day. If I sit here for four or five hours, I'll get an update tab. Mm-hmm. So it's con- constantly updating without a reboot on the fly. So that's something you might want to look for um, in the in the virus scanners. How effective is it and how often it updates mm-hmm. to, to help capture those zero-day problems? The so, thing is, it, it depends on how it operates in that case. Because uh, some virus scanners will only apply updates after a reboot so that it can reload its core functionality. It doesn't want to assume that that update is is fine until a reboot happens and the core function runs before the OS starts getting going and then it'll start incorporating the updates. Other virus scanners take a more liberal approach. They'll download updates to like the uh, the table of known signatures and they'll incorporate those immediately but leave core functionality for next restart and they just don't tell you. So it could just be the way it's designed. And there's also the operating system updates that have to be installed. You know, it's mm-hmm. like if there's a problem with the operating system, the virus scanner could be knocked offline. I mean, some some viruses will actually work to disable the antivirus um, so that it looks like it's still running, but it's not yep. actually running. Um, so you're still going to have to reboot because your operating system is going to most likely require a reboot anyway. Okay. Yeah. No, that's good, though, that, you, that I know that. It's like a Jedi mind trick. They're tricking me saying, look, it updated. Oh, maybe not. Mm-hmm. So, or at least maybe not the core functionality. That's good stuff. One last thing on 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 desktop wallets before we go on to the we need to get on to the um, nodes staking yes. nodes staking yeah. nodes, and then we have a few Reddit questions right that now. That is, uh, okay. if I if I'm installing a new wallet on my desktop, should I read the words out loud? I can read it and say, oh, mm-hmm. Bob, write down Bob, chicken, duck, cow nuts, taco, whatever, and I write that down as I'm and I say it out loud, is that a good idea? No. Why no. not? It, it, and the degree to which I say that loudly will depend on where you are and what your situation is. Because Alexa will steal your money. Yep. <laughs> there are microphones everywhere, right? Your phone, your computer, Alexa, whatever the Google version of that is. And a virus the, that turns your microphone on? 
Yeah, yeah. That's that's built into like even script pity versions. Like Metasploit is a whole framework of vulnerability vulnerabilities that people can use. And they're like on demand. So as soon as you find a vulnerability, you load up the accompanying Metasploit module and then bam, fire it off. And then the general shell that Metasploit generates has is called Meterpreter. And Meterpreter has some very interesting functions, including a general key logger a video, loading your webcam up, recording your microphone, taking screenshots, you know, all kinds of really helpful things for me and really devastating things for you. And that's, uh, that's even becoming so accessible that your average, like uh, what, what we would call them are script kitties, like the, the really beginner style hackers, right? <laughs> the average level of knowledge required is getting lower and lower and lower for being able to do these kinds of attacks. And so, yeah, if you're in a Starbucks, definitely not. If you're at home, you know, it's, it's not the worst thing in the world if you do it, but, you know, it, I would feel uncomfortable doing it. But if you're, if you're concerned about this, no, don't. Just don't. You can control it. It's something that you can control that removes a piece of your attack surface. And, yeah, do it every time, every time you can. And also maybe when you write those codes down, those words, you have to pay attention to where you're putting them too. <laughs> yep, yep. But somewhere where somebody can pick it up. Um, you might even want to consider, um, I have some something I keep in my brain so that when I write these words, so I, so I won't remember all those words, but when I'm writing them down, I'm not writing down the, the even the, the same words um, because I have some way of some memory trick that I use that when I see the words, I know what I actually mean. And so then when I write, so if you were to get that piece of paper, um, it actually wouldn't even benefit you unless you knew how my brain worked on the inside, um, which I mean, it could happen. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Uh, but at the same time, when you, if you do something like that, make sure you remember what you're doing, <laughs> you know, because you, you don't want to have these words. Like, these, these are the words. Oh, I can't remember what I did. Um, <laughs> so, so, like, you know, as soon as somebody might be able to get to that paper, but, uh, you know, so store it safely, um, you know, maybe kind of mix it up a little bit or even put half of it somewhere and half of it somewhere else. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, just... Simple yeah, tricks so. are very effective, most cases, like that, just cutting it up in half and putting it in different places. Don't frame it on your wall, you know. Don't make it obvious where it is. Oh, I get mine tattooed on my forearm. Didn't you see yeah. that? No, I'm just kidding, man. <laughs> I guess don't let people know how much you have, too. I mean, so I mean, you're, less of a, you're less of a target there, too. Mm -hmm. yeah, don't worry about being on the top 1,000 rich list or something because then somebody's yeah. going to post it outside yeah. your house. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So. If you're in that rich list, you know, maybe keep a, a lower key online. So, mm -hmm. you know, no one's going to go make that trek or make that journey if they know you're like holding like five ADA in your, in your, in your paper wallet or something like that. But yeah, uh, there was, there was a guy I used to know who, who was very public about like, uh, you know, his holdings and such. And what a trick he used was he had a bunch of wallets of the varying cryptocurrencies he, he had holdings of, but they were all um, very low amounts. And he would only show those. So his real holdings were in completely separate accounts. So then you you can be part of the discussion. You're like, I hold this much, but you always have these low numbers. And that's that's sort of what you can do as well. You can blend in with the crowd mm. if you want to do it that way. Yeah. You don't always have to take the approach of you're hiding something because then people get curious. I know I would. You know, if you're if you're obviously hiding something, I want to know what you're hiding. And if you're constantly hiding your amount, I might wonder if it's very large. But uh, little tricks like that can make me like, oh, he has like 100 data. Who cares? Yeah, and that smaller one. Uh, you know, he does come out with a gun. You can just let him have it. You know, exactly. Yeah. Secondary purpose. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. Cool. So I'm running a staking pool. And it sits on a, a bare metal server somewhere, whatever. Then I make a website saying I have a staking pool. Is there any vulnerabilities with just a web page, just data? It's my staking pool. I'll put my own name out there. That would be cheesy. So my staking pool is called blah. Is there a problem with that? That depends. If you're, I mean, I wouldn't put the website on the same server as your <laughs> staking pool because uh, I could just give somebody another way in and what does your website have on it? What is if it's giving people instructions on how to join up with your, it, it tells them the percent and the, 
wallet code. There's a little code that says point to that pool. So okay, but now, go ahead. Now, now you're saying it says the percent, so it's not just a blank page. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's, so it's, it's just getting gives... information from somewhere. Okay. And Even if it's just yeah, static number, I just type in, I'm going to collect 1% and you get the rest or whatever the case may be. And here's the address you point to. If somebody were to change the address to their own staking pool, then they could get that stake assigned to them. It's not a threat to the end user, um, you know, because they're not giving their ADA over to you. Uh, when they're joining the staking pool, they're just saying, I, I, I proxy my, my vote to this guy. And so it's not a threat, but, you know, somebody could get, you know, their votes proxied to them instead of you. So it's like a little bit of a risk to you. Um, another there's still a threat. A potential possibility is that there, it could be more instructions on there where they're telling people to send send some money to this address or something to be able to be part of the pool. And, you know, so, you know, the instructions could be wrong and people might fall victim to that. Um, I love the way you think. I never even thought of that. <laughs> God. Like there's a, if, if you can keep the website off of the same server that runs the node, that would be, that would be at least ideal. But even then you can run into trouble with function creep. So you're going to inevitably add more, more functions to your website, more details, more data. Cause otherwise, why would people visit? Right. Yep. Why are people going to visit your staking pool website? If it's just going to be, Hey, this is my stake pool. It's called uh, Add a Cadabra. You know, like it's it's a cool stake pool. Join it, and then it just stays like that yep. forever. And no you know what, Nalorian? That leads us right into the next question, which is a little more complex. Let's mm -hmm. say I'm an advanced user, and I make a website that connects to my stake pool and allows users to view and manipulate data related to the stake pool or their own account on the stake pool. Yeah. Now, what are the problems? Now you're getting into all the different realms of where like web penetration testing comes into play. So I, I'm going to analyze every single function that you're that you're using to call your backend, and I'm going to see exactly where they break. And the the whole purpose is like a, a lot of a lot of people run into trouble with uh, cross site scripting, uh, file uploads, uh, cross site request forgeries, you know, command injections and SQL injections. And the the command injection and SQL injections are among the most dangerous, but cross-site scripting should not be underestimated by any means. Because uh, you can do a lot of creative things. And uh, if, if it's talking directly with the staking pool node and there's a vulnerability on the server side that results in command execution, we call that RCE, remote command execution. If there's RCE, then I can start. I can start creating the building blocks of taking over your system, and once that's done, I I don't even need the website anymore. There's a good chance that whatever information you're needing, you might be able to get it off the public blockchain anyway. So mm -hmm. I would go that route instead of talking back to your server because you don't yep. really want to have the the staking pool directly connected in any way because you, know, you want to use like a relay or something uh, between it and the internet in the first place. Um, but I, th I would think in most cases there's, there'd be a way of pulling whatever information you need publicly, you know, from the same sources that anybody else would be getting it from. And then you just have your website feed off of that. And then you're not introducing any additional risk uh, to your staking pool. Yeah. Remember everything you add that talks to your, your uh, server is a is a potential hole and that's that's what we'll investigate and if it's not us it's someone worse right like uh, we'll most likely we'll we'll test the sites that are coming out on the on the telegram just uh, out of principle right and and we'll start talking to people about their websites but uh for the most part the guy who's after your money he's not going to tell you anything He's just going to happily crash your application and wait for it to come back online and try again until he has something that works. And it goes like that until it's it's the worst when those attacks stop because you know two things: either they either they gave up or they succeeded. Hmm. Wow! Didn't even think of that. So this is we're talking about someone's running a, a node on a bare metal server. Hmm. They're running a website. It could be anywhere, but somehow they connect and they talk to each other. So there are attack surfaces that people need to be aware of. Have you noticed any so far? You don't have to tell me what it is, but have you have you picked up on any yet? 
of uh, of the sites that I've seen so far, a lot of people are are doing a lot of simple mistakes. Uh, of course, the the functionality of Jormungandr and JCLI are not yet complete, so we we don't exactly know what's going to happen in the, in the following months, and definitely not what Shelley 1.0 is going to look like. You know, when Shelly is released to the to the to the actual mainnet, it could be a completely different application. So uh, I want to attack it, but I don't want to attack it yet. So because you have to remember, Shelly itself opens ports on the server, and there are ways to get like buffer overflow exploits are, are very common with stuff that opens ports and operates in the background on the machine. And I I hope that IOHKs and Emergo are you know, decent enough to to prevent that, but you never know. And so, you know, we we are going to investigate attacking the actual protocol itself or the implementation of that protocol, because that's what you have to remember. the The implementation is a completely separate thing from the actual research. There is there are hundreds and hundreds of papers on RSA. You know, the encryption used to generate public key cryptography for, for SSHing into boxes and things like that, remote connections. And that research is very, very sound and provably secure, so long as a few things are, are known. The key size isn't too short and the passwords used to protect those keys aren't, you know, too easy and stuff like that. Supposing I had access to your private key that was password encrypted, or if I didn't, that the key size isn't too short that I can't brute force. But... If the implementation on the server side or the implementation that uses RSA or generates the key pair is, is lacking, even if the proof is sound, then there's a vulnerability. And that, that was uh, really apparent uh, a few years ago when RSA had a, had a bug in its implementation that didn't use a proper uh, random number generator. So you could basically brute force every single key that was possible and then just keep checking the server for which key was being used. And most people just uh, allow public, public key authentication. So you just got into servers randomly. So it's really going to depend how well the implementation is done. But apart from that, everything you add adds another vector. If you have a website and it's on the same server, I'm going to attack that from every angle I can think of because that's another vector. Now I know you have a web server installed. Now I know you probably have SQL installed. Now I know your other ports are listening on the local host, if they're not listening globally. I've seen websites that allow their database to be accessible from the internet. That's, <laughs> that's a huge no. And um, everything you add to that on top of it just adds another layer of complexity that you have to think about when adding your security architecture together and trying to piece it into an actual fortress and then you have relays which can go you know one of two different ways like s suppose i had a relay that um that just passed whatever data i was sending to it to another server and that's a completely different scenario than if the relay is actually processing the information and then passing that to the server. So what if the command injection is actually on the relay and I get access to the relay? Then I can just man in the middle all the connections going through it and see what I can figure out about the users, who they are, where they are, and you know, general other information. Perhaps the attack is not about the node itself, but the users of that node. In, like the, the creativity possibilities for this kind of thing are endless. So the less you put in the same place, the better. You really want to separate things out. We had one key point from the PowerPoint at the beginning, hmm. and we talked about bare metal servers and home computer nodes, which are how people most often conceptualize a Jormungandr stake pool or a pool operator. So there's one more example we, we need to touch on. Some of the pool operators are going to run nodes out on the internet in a cloud server. Amazon Web Service Cloud Server or Ionos or any of the big brands out there or any brand for, for that matter. Are there any specific vulnerabilities or attack surfaces that pool operators need to be aware of when using a cloud service? Sometimes Amazon goes down. <laughs> it happens. If everybody's on Amazon, then they're all down. You know, so definitely wouldn't want to have all of the core servers on Amazon. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's one one thing that comes to mind. 
Um, also, you're, you're, of... you're again delegating your security. So you, you always have to keep that in mind. Like uh, we, we have these frequent debates about whether or not to include uh, external JavaScript into, into pages, websites during penetration tests of web applications. And we, we go back and forth on this debate all the time. The general idea is if you, if you load a script from an external source and they get hacked, they can change the script to be something else malicious and then it ends up in your website. And in a similar fashion, Amazon controls the server under which you are using. If, uh, if they decide to, they could look into your server and grab your keys. And who knows what employee somewhere in a data center is disgruntled with Amazon and wants to leave with a huge boatload of money or any, any of the keys that reside on said server, any other information that they can find. It, uh, of course, when you delegate stake, you don't delegate the actual ADA, so that's good. You you actually delegate the right to vote, which is which is a very nice key to remember. So it's a it's less of a huge threat in that case, but uh, people are going to do it. It's it's a nobody wants to sit a server in the middle of their house and have it screaming twenty four seven. So yeah, it's it's going to happen. You just have to remember that you're delegating some of your security to a third party. I never even thought of that. Oh my gosh! So if if I run uh, a cheap, uh, I had a, a low budge cloud server one time. Mm -hmm. By default, it did not have antivirus running. It's just sitting out there in, in a large business cloud service. It was like a two gig RAM, two, two core uh, server out there mm -hmm. in the world somewhere. And I could SSH into it or pull it up on a web page. Mm -hmm. It didn't have an antivirus scanner running on it. No. Nope. Will, will the outer perimeter of that business protect it from an antivirus scanner? I don't think it will. Well, it, that, that also depends because uh, Amazon, Amazon Web Services are not bad, right? In, in so far as generally deployed servers go, right? But you're still responsible for the, for the configuration of the server. They'll give you some blank Ubuntu or some blank Debian distro or some blank Windows, whatever, whatever Windows people use these days. And you, you'll have to configure it just like you, you configure something at your home, except for the fact that you have to be very considerate of, you know, that people are going to try to attack this thing. It's not like your computer at home in, in the general sense. They, they can 24 seven run, run scanning software against it. You have to be willing to do things the hard way. Yeah, but, definitely. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to like Amazon, you know, they're, they have security teams. They're going to be better at the security of the infrastructure yeah. than you are probably. Um, but yeah, on the server itself or whatever web pages or web apps you're running, you have to be willing to you know, do it the hard way. You actually follow the best practices. It's not hard to find from the various software vendors what the best practices are for setting things up. And just mm -hmm. do it. It's, it's harder, but it's better in the long run. <laughs> Easier yeah. in the long run. You don't have to recover from a hack as well. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was a surprise. Uh, it was a surprise. I didn't think that, that, that someone can, a disgruntled employee, if you're running it in the cloud, they could take a copy of that server and just say, eh, or they can look at it. And they usually have a way, a backdoor of getting into it. Yeah. You know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And red teams have to think about that all the time because we're not just defending against outside threats. We're defending against internal ones as well. What access each employee has, what access each person has and, that's why you have, even within like people who have card systems to get into their places of business, they'll know because their cards don't work everywhere in the building. And that's for a reason, because you can't trust everybody with everything. <laughs> you can't trust those cards either. There's like yeah, exactly. proxy, yeah. proxy clone <laughs> devices where you can just walk up and you just kind of brush up against a person when they're in line, line at the deli and it clones their card. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, you guys have no idea. That's a whole other world in by itself. You just walk by people, and there are even uh, whole sets of people who are so fascinated by this. They're generating, or they're not generating. They're building antennas that can read cards from feet or even meters away. So mm -hmm. they just walk by people and get a bunch of badges for some police thing somewhere, and just walk in. What about a tangent card? It oh, it has a near field comms that you touch on the back of the phone. Of course, oh, yeah. it doesn't work with iPhone, but if you have an Android, okay, tangent card. That's near field. Is that the kind of thing that could be scanned, bumped? Uh, basically, anything that's near field, um, any any RFID card or any near field card, 
probably can be read. The question is how how it does its authentication mechanism. So there, some of them will actually do a, a request. So the machine will request of the card, and the card will do some processing, send back a response, and it'll do that several times. And that's that's a little bit better than currently most of the cards out there, where they just basically say, "Hi, I'm ID 002A. Uh, do I have access to this building?" And the building goes, "Let me look that up in the database." Yep, you do. And that's pretty much the way most of them work these days still to this day. So I don't know that specific card's implementation, but there are varying types and uh, and whether or not it's vulnerable to something currently, I don't know. But Some of them are, I, the process is actually powered from the radio signal, has enough yeah. energy in it that'll power the processor. Yeah. But I mean, if you're talking about like security and cards and stuff, I, mean, I was able to compromise one, system, uh, one building by taking a paperclip and taping it to the thing where it was pushed up against the, the magnet. So when somebody came through and opened the door, the paperclip popped up in there, and that little gap was just enough to keep the door from locking. <laughs> yeah. oh wow. <laughs> nice. Man, That's where you clever. get into the world of physical, physical security <laughs> tests. Yeah. 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 Hey, there was a uh, screen share, and then we have the Reddit um, questions there, and uh, the remaining, which we've covered a lot of that information. But uh, Nalorian, did you want to show us how you can scan these servers or scan a server? You had some information available that you were going to share with us. Yeah, I suppose I could. Yeah. Um... And yeah, give it a shot. If we need a moment to collect ourselves, we can pause that. But if you're ready to roll, then... just make it sure nothing uh, vital or my OSINT is all together. <laughs> In your hacker tools, hide those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, most of them are pretty public tools. Like the um, the general two sets people use is uh, just stuff that's released on GitHub, you know, and the Metasploit is a big one, SearchSploit, ExploitDB, and all the other tools that people use. There's entire distributions of Linux completely designed around mm -hmm. penetration testing. One of the most popular is Kali. And that's offered by offensive security, the same people that give out certifications for hackers in professional aspects. So they, the tools are there and they're becoming easier to find, which is the scary part. Yeah, because then you get someone who's a little bit more than a script kid, he gets a hold of that stuff. And now they have a lot of power at their fingertips. Yeah. Get some free, free security audits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So long yeah. as they don't get anything, then it's not free anymore. <laughs> yeah. I just do the basic stuff. I use the, like, what is my IP port scanner to check my ports, make sure I don't have anything open to the broad mm -hmm. internet. But I noticed lately they have cut back on, I used to be able to do a broad port scan all the way from zero to 65,000, whatever port yeah, number. 5535. Yeah. Hey, yeah. There you go. What he said. <laughs> and they trimmed it down. Now you can only pick groups like scan gaming ports, scan something or other. So it's not as thorough as it used to be. And it's people are abusing it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, like I could use it to scan your computer mm -hmm. and they're abusing it. Yeah. But yeah, the but key was, it was so that I could scan my server, my house, my computer, but yeah, people abused it. So Well, tools for scanning yourself are, like uh, if you're if you're familiar with Linux, you can download MMAP, and MMAP is really good. You can just set that to scan everything in your local network and see what it what pops up. Chances are something will pop up. But there's also uh, for the more user friendly amongst, and you don't have that many things to check. There's Nessus. Nessus has a free version that you can just download and run against your network, and it'll show you like uh, all the infos, all the medium high risk vulnerabilities that it finds. Some of them may be false positives, but at least it gives you an overview of what your security looks like, and, at the very least for, a footprint of it. For the absolute beginner, you know, like installing Nessus isn't necessarily easy for somebody who doesn't know much about this. I mean, there's, yeah. there's other things like, like Trend Micro has like a house call tool that will actually you know, check out your network. I, I'm not, not, not going to say that that particular thing is like the best thing to use, but at the same time, it'll, it'll give your network a check out and just see if there's anything obviously wrong. Um, so there's, there's consumer level tools for scanning besides, you know, the 
the more expert level tools because most people if they type in nmap into their computer they're not going to know what to do <laughs> yeah i but, guess I, I always have trouble like recommending stuff like that to help people like figure out what their own security looks like because uh, you never know like, what their what their level is with mm -hmm. computers at all and it's not it's not easy to point someone to a very very easy way to check what their security looks like because it, it's kind of it's kind of it's you don't want them to have a false sense of security. So people who run virus scanners and only virus scanners, one type of virus scanner, like once a week, and that's it. They they may be lulled into a false sense of security, saying, "Oh, my computer's safe; it didn't find anything." No, never think that, because that one virus scanner may be missing something. It may not do a heuristic detection on this type of virus. It may not do signature detection on that kind of virus. And that's why you have uh, services like VirusTotal, where you can upload a suspect file. If you even have a question, just throw it in there, so long as it's not sensitive to you. Like, don't put your private keys in there. But you know, like, if you have a you know questionable.exe, then just upload it and see if uh, VirusTotal will go through known signatures of all kinds of different virus scanning software and see if it pops up or it knows about it. And that's a uh, that's a little bit better. Still not great, but it's a little better and it's a lot easier. Anyway, yeah. So in general, don't don't run it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you if you can at all avoid it, just don't run it. Like I social engineered a company recently, they I knew what software they were running. They had a specialized application for their um, for what they do. I don't want to say who they are. Um, and I just called pretending like I was uh, from their software vendor that they use and said, you know, there's this new update we need to install. And he, he downloaded the update. I didn't have the, it actually popped up a digital signature warning. I said, um, I just said, yeah, that's, that's normal. <laughs> and he just clicks right past it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Most people will just click away from the stuff that's meant to protect them because, you know, I want to see the info now. I don't want to wait. So be, be very careful with your, with your own biases towards internet security. It, it, it really kicks you. It does. Yeah. God, that's something I would have done. That's normal. Click. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It's totally normal. Don't worry about it. Okay. I mean, who would know anything about some weird industry specific application? You don't expect that somebody who has some insider lingo into your specific thing is going to be some random hacker on the internet, you know? Yep. Yep. But in, in this case, it, it, they were dealing with financial information, you know? So it could have been devastating. There, it might have been worth it to some random hacker on the internet to figure it out. Yep. Is it wow. worth it? Yeah. Is it worth it? That's uh yeah, it's like the club, you know, it, yeah. the club is just like a iron bar, uh, but it does prevent people from stealing your car because the next car doesn't have the club. So just make yourself at least more difficult than somebody else. Exactly. And you're less yeah. likely to be a target. Uh, that you, doesn't entice hackers. Like, Oh, this is a hard target. Let me go after that guy. Sometimes he's hiding something. So, sometimes if it's if it's like a direct challenge like whenever a website puts out oh, check out our software it's unhackable yeah that's that's a challenge you know how i said when i was talking about well wars i assume it'll be hacked i hope it doesn't get hacked <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i say that partially just so i don't necessarily invite somebody who's really determined yeah. <laughs> i mean yeah you know, if somebody is really determined and they can hack it and you tell me about it we'll be friends you know uh, <laughs> don't break yeah. it we'll, we'll be friends so i'll fix that's it a Mm -hmm. Someone took my tweet for this podcast and uh, that I sent out from the Crown Effect and said, hackers wanted, you know, hey, we're looking for hackers, red team penetration engineers. I, I worded it poorly, but, and someone else took it and, and turned it into a challenge. And I was like, <laughs> no, that's yeah. not what we wanted to do. Enter challenge accepted means. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've seen TV. I know there's hackers out there that'll break it. Yes. All right. Okay. Did you want to do the screen share? We'll back to Reddit. You good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go for it. Okay. I guess. Uh, what do you What do you really want to look at? I guess. Okay, so uh, a lot of people will be like, I have command injection, uh, cross site scripting, SQL injection, and uh, yeah, I think those are the three most common ones that I see, other than file upload. But file upload is a whole different story. But this is um, this is DVWA, which is damn vulnerable web application. 
And this is really nice. I, I recommend any developer to play with this because it's basically like all the mistakes that people make generally on their website. And there's even some nice uh, things here. So if you come to any, any uh, module on the side here, you can actually view the source of what makes the module work. And the best thing is you can actually see what is currently, uh, currently assessed as you know, generally the industry practice. And you can see how that code differs from maybe what you've written, which might be all the way down here, right? And that's a really useful resource to be able to do things and to figure out where you might be failing. But this one is just uh, as an example. So I'm running a staking node here, right? Jormungandr is running. It has some delegated stake to it and you know, stuff is happening. And say I don't want to attack Jormungandr directly. I mean, maybe later I might want to, but right now I want to go for the easy, easy uh, money, right? So you, I find you have a website on your staking node. Well, I'm going to start attacking this because it's the lowest hanging fruit. It's the easiest. We're lazy. We don't like doing work. We want free money, right? So I might come over here and I and I'm start and might start looking at your page and and what it does and looking at the different functions, start generating requests and generally get a feel for how it works and what happens. And then I might take some of those and add them to my list of things I wanna try. So for example, over here in command injection, like this is basically just a thing that pings something. And this largely depends on what the function of your site is. But if you have anything like this, where you have a command that's gonna go into the page and then the page is going to generate something. This doesn't have to be the ping command. It could be a Python script that gives you a list of current users on the node. It could be like load statistics or server statistics or whatever. You have to be very careful about how that works. Now I've set the security to low here just for demonstration purposes, but the only difference between low and high is the level of work required to get things working. But in essence, all you have to do is to test something like this is see if you can inject a new command in the same command. So currently it should spit out this output, but if I send this thing here and it waits for the command to enter, you'll notice that there's extra stuff here. Mm -hmm. And that's how I would test for this. This is the actual directory listing of the current working directory. So, so you added that ls command in there and made it yep. spit that out. And if that exactly. were a private key or some piece of data the attacker was looking for, it would have spit that data out. Oh, it can get much worse. Watch this. Oh. So now I'm starting a listener here. And I'm listening for connections. So instead of going to en enter this command, which is basically, uh, you know, it's on most Unix systems like Ubuntu, Debian. It's just a uh, netcat which is just a, a, it's a networking tool. And I'm gonna tell it, give me bash please. And you know, send it over here to my IP. I'm gonna send that off. And after it's done pinging that device, it's going to connect to me. And now I can do stuff. So you're connected to a terminal on another node. Exactly. Oh my gosh. That's like some hacking stuff right there. So I'm gonna spawn the actual shell now. And there it is. Oh yeah, I don't have that. Yeah, and there's the same directory listing. Now I'm just gonna move on over to home slash Millarian slash resource. And this is why you don't let your web server have um, <laughs> any more permissions on the server. Than exactly. It's the second yeah. problem is you notice that the user that I'm operating as currently is www.data, which is you know the default user of Apache. But I have no permission restrictions on reading these files. So I can just like move into these folders, no problem. And now here, there it is, all the secrets. Wow. I, w I should get to the IP address to my old Namecheap server that, and let you have had it with that one. I'm not using it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Find out if you could, you know, how wide open that thing is. So all I have to do is, yeah, download all this stuff and... Now I have all your pool secrets. And that's, it doesn't stop there either. So a lot of people underestimate cross-site scripting. So cross-site scripting, for example, is just, uh, here's, here's some 
general guest book. This could be a chat application. This could be, uh, yeah, guest books are popular on most websites like signing, I was here. But more often than not, it's chat. So self-implemented chat. So I enter a name and I'm like, hello, right? And the guest book gets updated. So I might check this again by saying this request and not doing that. Yeah, and IR Evil says, hey, everyone. And then IR Evil gets an idea. that he might be able to, oh, if Burp will stop doing things, that he might be able to make stuff happen here. That's not supposed to happen. So generally speaking, HTML is not supposed to be loaded directly from user supplied input, but in some cases you can get it to work. And you'll notice something when I reload this after I send this. So we'll go back to the page. if I didn't break it. Ah, yeah. Notice that this fired. What alert one does is it basically makes the browser put up an alert and then it just puts one in there because that's what I put here. That was JavaScript running. Yeah. yeah. And that tells me, and notice again that you don't see that in the chat message itself. So that script is completely invisible unless I do the alert. So what else can we do? So let's clear the guest book and go back into it again. Now I have a stored session here that this is a, a, it looks complicated, but all this is doing is it's saying, I want you to take things like the app code name, the document cookie and a, bu a bunch of other information. I want you to send it over to this. So I'm gonna again, start my listener. And I'm going to send this off instead. And IR Evil has now a new message stored for us. And it says, what a day, right? And now you'll notice over here, I got a connection and it was completely invisible. And in here is one very important thing. And that's the PHP session ID. So if I do this again, now this is obviously my web browser. So it's, you know, it's not that important, but say the administrator comes along and he's like, oh, I think I'm going to, so I'm the administrator over here. And I'm going to browse my guest book and I'm going to take a look at my guest book and see how people are doing and all that stuff. Oh, look at that. That I ran have, in the background. Yep. No problem. Yeah, now the JavaScript sent it over. Yep. The JavaScript sent it over. So now I can log out here and I can just be like, I want to now burp is doing something that's called a proxy. And I am going to intercept the next request because currently I'm not logged in. Now watch, I'm not going to type anything into here and I'm just going to go, uh, give me this page, please. But instead of this PHP session, I'm going to give the administrators instead. Or if I can actually copy it properly like a human. And I'm going to forward that off. I'm the administrator now. So that didn't use the username and password for the admin. That just said, nope. hey, there's a session. Yep. When you log into websites, you generally get session IDs, session tokens. That's why you don't have to log in every time that you click a new page within the, the website. It's, it's what identifies you. So if I can steal that, then I can become you. So long as you are logged in. So if, if he logs out and the session is destroyed, that's another vulnerability, by the way. If someone logs out and the session is not destroyed, then this is indefinite. But if he logs out here, I should have no more access. But so long as I am the administrator, maybe I want to do some other stuff here, change some settings around. Maybe I want to, you know, whatever your website has access to, suddenly I have access to as well. There's there's multiple levels of protection against something like this. I mean, the code has a problem. You know, I mean, that's what this is made for is to have problematic code. Yeah. The, the code has a problem that could be fixed, but you also have to kind of assume that you're not going to catch everything, that there will be some flaw that skates through. Uh, so you can actually configure the web server to not allow inline code. Now, 
what, what the web server does is it'll send a header down to the web browser to say, don't trust me for inline JavaScript. And then the browser, when it sees inline JavaScript, it just won't run it. Uh, so you, so there's, there's multiple levels, you know, having good code, but also the web server can tell the web user going to the site what it should and shouldn't trust. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's ways to mitigate this sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, one, of the, one of the last, uh, I think one more should be sufficient, and that's uh, I'm going to log back into Smithy. Uh, that's SQL injection. This is a very common problem as well. When people want to look up things, they, they connect it to their database of information. So user ID two is uh, Gordon Brown, for example. And I'll take that request as well. And you see the ID that's used in the request is here. So if I send that to, if I send that off, I should get, yeah, the first name administrator, surname admin, right? And I'll test that simply by doing this. And if I see something like this, I know that uh, I get real excited. So your SQL has, syntax has an error, you know, and in this case it shows me, but most of the times it won't. But as soon as I see this, I come back over here and I, I start going like this. Uh, SQL dot break. And I just basically copied this and put it into that file, sql.reg. And it's going to take that, and basically, it's going to dump the database for me if I can actually do that again properly. Yes. And you'll see how fast this is. Not, not at all a problem. It's going through, it's testing for SQL vulnerabilities, and it's going to identify the ID parameter, as you can see here, as a vulnerable thing. And eventually, when it's done, it's going to tell me the ID is vulnerable. Uh, do you want to keep checking? I go, nope. Uh, would you like to do temporary files? No, I don't think I need to right now. Do you want to crack? Yep, I do. And use the default word list. Uh, common, no, I don't think I want to do that. And let's uh, crack all the passwords while we're at it. And there's the Yep. And there's all the passwords coming off the website for me. And boom, there's the whole database dumped. So not only did it dump the entire user's database, but I now have admin's password. Now I can log in whatever password. I want. <laughs> yeah, password. Yeah, well, you know, I can't sit here for 20 minutes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you no, get if, the they, if they'd have used a really big complex password, yes, then that gets harder. Uh, and that, all, again, everything you do about security plays in. Like if... If this guy's password was uh, something like, like, let's just generate something real quick. Blarg2, like that. If it's if your passwords are like this, then yeah, this would have never worked. At least it would have still dumped the database and the hash of the database, but this, the clear text password, would not have shown up to me. I would have had to done more advanced cracking techniques, which not, aren't impossible, but are much harder. So if I have Smithy over here with a cheap password, I'm going to go for him first. So again, who's easier, right? And once there's a hole in your website, I don't care how strong Jormungandr is at all. If your website is, is poor, then I'm going to go straight through that like a tunnel. That's really cool. That's all I can say about that. I mean, it's very interesting to learn with mother's vulnerabilities. Now, you may, you may not be able to attack the Cardano protocol itself, mm -hmm. but you can wreck that wallet and get data about the users possibly i don't know but possibly you you would definitely have way more information than i would want any hacker to have yep so okay. if you so if there are people out there i'm a perfect example you're protecting me from myself i'm the kind of guy that would take okay i've got this particular wallet and i'm going to attach a web page to it and try to do a web service call and copy and paste the code that some guy put on github what's going to happen yeah. well yeah <laughs> okay i i'd be real nervous yeah yeah yeah. No, I won't actually do that. I'm just using that as an example. <laughs> I keep the web web page and the wallet separate. You know, that's yep. yeah. The web page yeah. is just advertisement. To be honest with you, the users out there, if you're going to run a stake pool, you don't need a web page. You just need a stake pool that's up as close to 100% as possible, and as secure as possible. And uh, that's the known parameters now. Oh, well, not to go into all the details, but 
uh, and a pledge and people using it. But as far as security goes, it will be selectable from within Yoroi and Daedalus. You'll be able to select the stake pools from inside there. The web page is a bonus. You, you know, provide users information. But uh, let's try to protect the users while we're doing that. So I've learned a lot from you guys. I really have. Are you guys ready? Last of the Reddit questions, see if we've already touched on it. Make sure we get our um, dedicated Reddit followers here information answered. You ready for, to wrap it up, Philippe? Yes, sounds good. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move over to the Reddit questions. And uh, thank you to all the Redditors who asked the question. The first question comes from Tony from Shoshone. And the question is, I would appreciate a detailed explanation of how to utilize relay nodes to protect the staking pool. How many relay nodes would you recommend? And would the relay nodes reside on the same LAN as a staking node, or would you host the relay nodes on multiple remote networks? Oof. That's that's hard. Even even large corporations have trouble with this question because there there are um, inside inside a corporation there will be uh, like your actual development server, your actual service, and then there will be jump hosts. And then there will be like, we have network segregated zones. So the red zone where all the stuff must be protected, the yellow zone where it's a lot of employees and then the blue zone where it's like kind of public, kind of not. And then the green zone, which is everyone. And that goes out to the internet and you can have multiple relays, multiple jump hosts, multiple configurations. And it really depends on what kind of services you're offering and uh, how you have your network configured or what you could do. Because the question also assumes that you have unlimited options, which you may not. Maybe you can only afford to have a couple of relay nodes, maybe three or four. And you want to access the European communities Well, you're going to have to have some communication going between you and overseas, uh, supposing you're in America or something like that. And uh, maybe you only have the possibility to operate a certain amount of nodes. And that that has to be taken into account. So there's no definitive answer on how many you need or what, what number you should have or how they should be configured or in what network they should be segmented. But um, mm. no, go I, ahead. I would say if you're going to be running multiple relay nodes, you'd probably want them geographically to disperse in the first place. Because I mean, you know, to gain that extra benefit of having you know, multiple ones, like if data center gets shut down, you know, yeah. you know that sort of things. But, so, uh, Cost is, I guess, a big part of it. You know, it's like how, how far do you want to go with this? You know, it's like that well worth I was talking about. I have, I mean, I could run it all on one server, but I'm not because uh, I don't think it's safe to, and I think it's going to be attacked and probably will be hacked at some point. So, mm -hmm. so I, I have, you know, multiple servers for it to segment things off. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, that's expensive too. You know, paying for multiple servers. Um, you know, so I mean, I'm not real savvy on the internal architecture of the uh, of the Cardano networking itself. But if you're going to have multiples, I, I wouldn't put them all in the same. It doesn't wouldn't make sense to me to put them all in the same network. Uh, spread them out a little bit. Yeah, and I don't I don't think anyone really understands that I know of what the current layout of relay nodes is. I know when I launched Daedalus. And I launch a little snitch. I can see my Daedalus connect to little snitch is the little app. And it shows me that it's connecting to a relay node, an IOHK relay node. And I've mm -hmm. tried it with, I've gotten a couple different locations, like one in, I don't know, Montana, one in Washington state, one in Tokyo, one in Malaysia. So I've seen it connect to the different relay nodes. I have no idea what they do. Uh, I'm thinking it just, it somehow strips data. Maybe it masks an IP. Do you guys have any idea what it does? I they just pass information. So you can have relay nodes that anonymize information where they strip data, they strip IPs. That's the whole that's the whole idea behind the Tor network. The Tor network's whole purpose is just a bunch of relay nodes that you can that you mask the IP very via a series of encryption schemes, the onion. That's why they call it the onion router. Because you can you strip a layer of encryption every time you pass on to a new node, and then it comes out or goes into the internal darknet. But you can still access normal sites via Tor as well, and it anonymizes data via this uh, encryption onion thing. But that's not necessary. Could it keep an attacker from DDoSing my node? Like no. say, let, let's say I have, for example, a bare metal node inside a business, 
Would the re- could the relay node stop a DDoS attack on that node? No, the re- relay node would become the target. If you're talking about like you know the the core node that creates the transactions, because the relay node, as I as I understand it, doesn't create transactions. Mm-hmm. Um, so that could get knocked down if you had multiples. If those are the only things talking to where the transactions are being created, then it helps out with that. Uh, but the relay nodes could also be DDoS, you know, so so they can knock them all down, I guess, and then then you can't can not get back into the core. Yeah, and I would hesitate to say that it would at all, because uh, theoretically speaking, if we're talking about a process that's passing on information, that process is probably a whole lot quicker than the actual relay node is processing the data within those messages. So if you're talking about 100, 1 million, 2 million requests a second or something like that, then they might pass through the relay node a lot faster than the actual node who is still receiving them via the relay node. Mm-hmm. And then it may crash anyway. It all depends on how the relay node is passing on messages. Maybe yeah. it is doing processing. Maybe it will go down first, but that's not a given. Hopefully it has some kind of throttling built in, but I've not gotten deep enough into the relay nodes to know that part yet. No, okay. and as I understand it, current Jormungandr implementation is very, very uh, against load balancers. Mm-hmm shall we say. So uh, it's kind of difficult to give anyone a recommendation at this point as to what to do about that. Okay. Well, I think that answers the question in general, and it gave us, it's a really good point on what the relay nodes are doing, how many would need to run. I don't know what the answer is. If the answer is, I don't know, that's fine. I don't even know. I didn't even know people could run relay nodes. I thought that was going to be part of the Emergo IOHK Cardano Foundation network infrastructure to have relays out there throughout the world. I don't know. Well, so. they could. Yeah, they could. And then other people may also add relay nodes to that network. You know, like it, it doesn't have to be just IOHK or just people. It could be a mixture of both where IOHK provides some as a baseline, you know, a general ring around the planet. And then people can add nodes to that network as they see fit. Uh, I don't know how they're going to do that, but that's it, it's not a requirement that it's either or. Maybe we should have Tony from Shoshone come on. He could tell us some more about it. If he can, yeah. I, yeah, well, I think he could. If I start uh, getting kind of hyper, it's because my wife just brought me some Cuban coffee. So. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> Let's see. That's very nice. All right. I think okay. that question's good. Okay. From Let0070 says, what resources would you recommend for someone looking to learn about cybersecurity? Ooh, uh there are many communities out there currently for, for people who are interested in getting on InfoSec. Obviously, a good place to start is, uh, is just to get a feel for things. is like the Security Stack Exchange. You can, you can get a lot of answers to basic questions there if you have a specific question in mind. But if you just want to get started, things like the, the thing that I showed, the vulnerable web application, DVWA is a great way to get started into the really basics ones. The levels of the exploits that I were using were very easy versions of those exploits. And as you move up that ladder, you start getting uh, more and more details about how what you have to change and how creative you have to be. There are also whole communities dedicated to server infiltration, like Hack the Box, where, where you actually have to hack the invite code to get in <laughs> to get a user account in, but that is not a, it's, it's not hard. Once you get some general understanding of how websites work and the JavaScript involved, then you can get in pretty easy. Or you can look up probably a write-up online, it's probably there. But uh, Hack the Box has easy boxes, medium boxes, hard boxes, and basically you get a VPN connection into a network and you can just hack away at a specific challenge. No problem. And to those sort of things we call CTS, like capture the flags. And they're, they're designed challenges for people to learn things about hacking or exploitation. It's like, what is the goal of the person as well? Like if they're doing it for professional reasons, there might be a certification that's relevant to their industry. So they could go through the training materials for that certification. Mm-hmm. Um, when, you know, many, many moons ago, I, um, I asked somebody like, you know, how are these computer viruses written? And, you know, he gave me a little bit of an idea and I went out and found a book called Little Black Book of Computer Viruses. And, uh, you know, I had to learn an assembly and I, you know, went through all the exercises in there and learned how to, how to write computer viruses. Um, 
I always had it where it would only infect a RAM drive on my computer, so, so I couldn't do that <laughs> by hand. Um, but going through that, learning how to do it, I now understand computer viruses very well. You know, some sometimes people will, there's something wrong with their computer, be acting a little wonky, and they're like, is it a virus? And it's like, you know, I can think about it like, no, no it's not a virus. <laughs> you know, because when you, when you get into it, when you're actually playing with these things, you, you know what's what it's capable of doing, what it's not capable of doing. And you get a good sense for it. So this is actually tinkering and, you know, like playing around with that website, that, that web application he showed, learning how to exploit the vulnerabilities and learning some scripting uh, programming. Because a lot of the stuff, the hacking type stuff does require some level of scripting. You know, you're not going to just want to sit there and try every single possible combination of something. You want to write a little script that does it for you. Yep. So like a little bit of programming, shell scripting, Python or JavaScript or whatever. And just kind of playing around with it um, or going after professional certification, then they lay it all out for you, what you should be learning. Yeah, like OSCP, uh, Alfred by Offensive Security, the same people that uh, give out the Kali Linux distribution for pen testing. Uh, that's that's a really good one. And it's not too hard for the beginner either. The, the course materials are laid out and then it basically gives you a playground to, to play with, but it leads you through that playground just a little bit, just enough that you have to Google about 80% instead of all of it. And, but something I really want to impress on people is that this, this kind of stuff, it's not the black magic that people think it is. I know that hacking appears to be like the magic of the 21st century, but it's, it's actually really easy. It's, it's answering the question, can I get this computer to do something that the developer didn't intend it to do? Hmm. And if you can answer that question with any other answer than the developer said, yep, I wanted to do this, then that's a hack. Is it useful? Is it not useful? Who knows? But hackers are really just curious people. We just like seeing how things work. And once we know how things work, obviously, you can make it do different stuff. Yep. And sometimes that different stuff is really, really cool. What's a quick summary on the, uh, the hats? White hat, red hat, gray hat, red team, black hat. What is that? Uh, so the, the color hats you wear are generally your attitude or what you, I guess you would call your alignment. So white hats are aligned with, uh, with order. So they're, they're like, you know, they, they want responsible disclosures. They want software to get better. They, if they find a vulnerability, they want to tell the developer and ideally have that the developer fix it before they disclose it publicly. Black hats are quite the opposite. They will find vulnerabilities and keep them, hoard them, sell them maybe to North Korea, who knows, or maybe just steal all of your money before you even know what happened. They're, they're very, uh, it's like the, the good and evil side. Like, basically. Are you going to be, are you completely law abiding? Then your white hat, if you're yeah. totally criminal, your black hat, and if you're willing to bend the rules a little bit, maybe not catch a felony, then your gray hat. <laughs> Yeah, gray is, gray is exactly what it sounds like. It's the gray area. So, you know, maybe maybe you're white hat, but maybe you think, uh, you know, breaking North Korea's laws on getting information out from its citizens is uh, probably a good idea rather than a bad one. Then that's a gray hat thing, because technically you're breaking the laws of a country. But at the same time, you believe it to be in the best interest of human rights. That's a gray hat thing. Red Interesting. So if the NSA breaks the law, that makes them black hat. Hmm. How about hmm. that? <laughs> red team hmm. and blue team is related to, well, it's like, so the red team is trying to break in, blue team is trying to stop them. Yeah. Um, and you're pitting those two groups against each other to see, um, you know, so like the blue team might be setting up defenses. The red team's trying to compromise those defenses. If, I, if I'm doing the red team thing and I sneak into a building and you know, I'm like trying to do something and the blue team guy is trying to find me. He's, he, he wants, he doesn't know I'm coming, but if he, but it, you know, he's got to win if he finds me before I can do yeah. anything. That's interesting. All right, That's Philippe, I think we got that question answered. We're ready for the next yes. one. We're almost yes. time to wrap up, right? Yeah, let's knock out these two. Um, you, um, Brinker59 asked, based on your experience, how well developed is Daedalus and Yodoi when it comes to security? Thank you. Uh, Daedalus, I haven't, I haven't played too much with, uh, the, the API of Daedalus, uh, that it's sending messages in so far that I've seen them so far seems pretty decent, but I haven't been able to understand fully exactly what the message API is apart from the ones that are in clear text. So I'm now reading through their application level 
um, the documentation for their application level messaging and seeing if I can figure out whether or not that it, it is in fact good. Uroi is is a is pretty standard as far as a, a plugin goes. The the main pitfall with Uroi is is the same as with any other wallet. If you're holding your private keys on your on your computer, they're at risk probably from some other vulnerability, not from the plugin itself. And okay. yeah, so I, I would worry a lot more about everything else you're doing than than Uroi or Daedalus itself, because they're sitting there, right? And that's probably where the attack is going to come from, not from the wallet itself, but from something else that you're doing. Yeah, I've not noticed any issues with them. I mean, Daedalus seems solid to me, but I've not done a detailed security review of it to be able to give a... You know. Yeah, I don't think anyone's willing to do a full audit or spend too much time on it just yet until they actually release like a major version revision, especially since Shelly's coming out soon. Or supposedly, we hope, you know, we dream. But <laughs> so long as it's not out, I don't really want to go into full detail looking for buffer overflows or integer exploitation on, on your Mangander, Daedalus, and all these applications until that's out. Because then there will actually be time, right? Right now, everything I research now could be undone in a couple months if they, if they release a completely different or majorly different software revision then maybe the vulnerability I found tomorrow is useless two months from now. And then it's not an issue. So we're, we're probably going to wait before we waste too much time auditing the software just yet. You okay. said we and audit in the same sentence. Hmm, I'm starting to think I figured out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I know runtime well, verification or someone did uh, um, auditing last year on the older code. But uh, yeah, I guess when a new code comes out, then that'd be a good time to check the security okay so um our last one is from yes. rodrigo gonzalez Lascano. yes okay it's thank you bringer 59 thank you let 070 and tony from shoshone last one from rodrigo gonzalez Lascano. it's um similar to the previous question he says for for an attack against nodes is it sufficient protection to use relays so in, in the short version what is that is absolutely it sufficient? not okay absolutely not no <laughs> Like okay. using relays as a defense is basically like uh, if someone, if your friend was shouting like instructions at you from far away, you would be asking them to defend you against a car on the highway. Okay. That's, that's kind of like what you're talking about because the, the amount of data that's going to come at your server and from which angle you don't know, the relays supposing that you have relays all the way around you it still doesn't mean that none of it reaches your server and if your server is sitting on the internet directly addressable in the first place then the relay doesn't even matter at that point yeah exactly yeah so it you really have to design your whole architecture from the ground up wow so the next questions are kind of following up on that is is with respect to relays how many are needed distribute in what way don't relay slow down the network so as, as far as slowing down the network, I, that's, that's not really a, it's kind of a false equivalency because technically speaking, if I'm, if I'm some poor country in Africa and there's a, there's only one relay that we can connect to, right. Then is it slower than not having one at all? So it is a relative question and yeah. also that that brings up his other part of that question distributed in what way i mean i guess geographically distributed is what they're referring to is, ideally, is there ideally you want uninterrupted connections between as many as possible that will that will mean the fastest load balancing between the networks can be done yeah, i don't have in-depth knowledge of that specific networking but in general a relay wouldn't necessarily slow things down because it can you know, prevent, you know, theoretically prevent certain types of traffic or vet traffic, uh, you know, allowing the, the core server to do less work um, because the relays are handling some of that work. Um, also, you know, if, if a client can connect to multiple relays, if one's getting inundated, they could be connected to another one. If they, you know, if you were to remove the relays and it would just be the core that's getting inundated. I mean, I, I don't, I can't 
answer authoritatively on this because I haven't gotten into those details yet. But I, relays don't necessarily slow things down. I mean, all my web servers have proxies sitting in front of them. Hmm. I I use um, I use like Nginx as a, as a web server that is proxying the actual web servers behind them, and that speeds things up. It makes it faster. There's some requests that the the uh, the proxy can fulfill without even asking the web server. And that's definitely speeding things up. Yeah, okay. basically it's hard to make any recommendations on things like relay servers, which is such a young network. As the network matures, the, the its own industry standards will start to emerge. So long as people keep being aware of that and keep asking each other questions, how do you do this? Is it better than my implementation? Is it better than my approach? Then then it'll start to mature by itself, kind of like the whole internet has ever since its inception. You know, there was a rolling best interest and best practice that kept coming up and eventually companies started employing it and developers started employing it. It just happens by itself. You just have to remain aware. But the specific question is kind of like telling the future right now. It's yeah. not an easy answer. Okay. okay. And this last question is a great wrap up um, for the episode. Again, thank you, Rodrigo Gonzalez Lascano for these questions. And he asks, what are the security mechanisms are necessary to protect the nodes without losing performance? So of everything we spoke about so far, is there anything else we would add to this? How do you protect nodes without losing performance? Relay or anything else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like a thousand answers to this one. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking the same thing, yeah. I, you, I mean, some of the, the most basic things is you, you, you firewall everything so that uh, only the packets get through that need to get through. And, you know, somebody's going to say, well, firewall is going to slow it down a little bit. But that's not necessarily true because um, with the firewall, now the server doesn't have to process all the random requests that are getting thrown at it for everything else. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and a lot of this security technology is very efficient now. You know, it's like a, it, it used to be a firewall was like kind of a bad deal. It's like, oh, I don't want this. It's going to slow down, but not, not so much anymore. Um, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, there's like a ton of best practices that you're going to want to go through. And, and for the most part, it's all really taken, ca taken care of. You know, the, the performance questions and issues have been addressed for most things. You're better off with it than without. And if we kind of take a step back and kind of look at what Cardano is aiming to achieve, the whole idea behind proof of stake in, in general is that it uses less power and less resources. So like if I would be worried about this question, basically, if I were operating something like this on Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is using proof of work and every process cycle that I dedicate to something else is less hashes for me, right? Less hashes per second. And that's not something we generally concern ourselves with with a proof of stake in the implementation because the whole idea is to have an easy way to produce blocks that doesn't take a lot of overhead. And then you can dedicate that overhead to other things like your security infrastructure. And uh, that's a whole other discussion. But, um, but I, I worry a lot less about things making your computer slow, but uh, you, can, you can employ some tricks. For example, if you can afford it, put your other services on a separate server then you don't have to worry about all those requests, all those like your website, if you can, should be, I would highly recommend it be on a completely different machine. And you you might even feed it data from the blockchain instead of your actual node. It might be a little delayed, but if there's no connection between your node and the site, then there's no path even if it's exploited to get there. And okay. that's the best. Yeah, I mean, if you want to get really into it, yeah, it's like you can have like your web server, which talks to an application server. So the logic runs on a separate server uh, through APIs, and then that server talks to a database server. So the web yeah. server doesn't even talk to a database. It talks to something else that talks to a database. I mean, you could really segment these things out to really make things secure. Um, but most people don't want to go through the trouble. I do because I don't want to get embarrassed <laughs> doing it. <laughs> Yeah, but the, I think even for the for the general operator, like like web servers, especially for like cloud services and stuff like that, which let's be honest, a lot of people are probably going to do uh, a cloud a VPS on a cloud service costs almost nothing these days with services like uh, Droplets, what was that, DigitalOcean, and Scaleway, for example. 
they, they cost you literally dollars per month. So to have two of them costs you maybe $4 a month for, for a really basic server. And you can scale them up as you go, depending on how many requests you're actually seeing. And you might find that your actual staking nodes remains at about a dollar per month. And your web server actually goes up to like 10 or 12 bucks a month because of all the attacks it's experiencing. But if your web server is experiencing all the attacks, you, you feel rather good because you're like, well, the, the node's not there. Who cares? You know? Well, not in who cares, but you get the idea. It's, it, they're not connected. So you, you want them to be diverted to the bait. <laughs> Yeah, I'm re reluctant to talk too much about that, but I'll sometimes set things up that looks like a, a good attack target. Just yeah, we call <laughs> so them it gets the attention. <laughs> yeah, that's they're, so. If I see it getting attention, I know that I know something's up. But also, it's like yeah. they're not hitting, hitting the thing that I don't want hit. <laughs> what do you call it the honey pot? Let's see. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yep. well, I've actually called. Uh, Legitimate systems honeypot before. <laughs> Just yeah. so that when they see that, like, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. wait, that's our real server. Yeah, it's a honeypot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's bad, right? <laughs> oh, man. Hey, guys, this has been a great podcast. I yes. so much appreciate you coming on here. Yes. yes. You're welcome to come back anytime. We have a lot more that can be discussed. Yes. Well, now that I have your email account, I'll just uh, you know invite myself. <laughs> you should. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I enjoy this. It's, yeah, I feel really positive about the future for this community. It seems yeah, like it's so. going in the right direction. If for nothing else, the the research that Cardano is doing is invaluable. Even if the whole project should fail, it wasn't for nothing because that the kind of things that end up in academic records are referred to later when people want to build great things. And that's the greatest shortfall of the whole cryptocurrency space so far. The proofs have come after the implementation. I much like this, this new idea of, of like, it's, like it's even new. It's been ever since you know Plato and Aristotle. Like think about it first and then implement it. And, but uh, so even if the whole project goes, goes to hell, it's, you have a bunch of these papers that will, that will eventually grow into other communities that will take its place. And then there's a whole bunch of research that was well-funded to build on. That can't be ignored. And it's open source and available. Yeah, exactly. Everyone. Yeah, the best kind, right? Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, James. Thank you, Nalorian, for showing up on the podcast. We really appreciate you. Like Rick was saying, you're welcome anytime. Um, I would encourage everyone that's listening to this episode that's made it this far, um, take security into your own hands. Make sure that you're protecting yourself. I want to leave you with a little story. Back in 2007, I believe, uh, Todd Davis, the CEO of LifeLock, uh, released some commercials online. Uh, basically, the commercials had his social security number on a truck driving through Manhattan. And I remember this. And identity theft 13 times afterwards. So don't be the thought, don't be the Todd Davis of <laughs> cryptocurrency. Make sure that you're not publishing your information. People will steal it. Even if you're 100% confident, if it's out there, it's going to get messed with. So um, with that being said, I think this concludes this episode of the Cardano Effect podcast. And thanks for everyone tuning in. And until the next episode, thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.